What were you doing back in Whiskey's decade of doldrums? What were you doing back in the 80s? I bet a lot of you watching this tonight were really quite young. You might be surprised to realise just how young Scotch single malt whisky was as a category back then as well. Hello whiskey folk, hello all you beautiful whiskey folk and welcome to all the dedicated barflies. It's fantastic to have you back for another uh, Thursday night V-Pub whiskey session. Tonight's theme is kind of a, uh, you might have picked up if you've been watching V-Pubs <laughs> ever along uh, the last few years, that I really quite enjoy how a lot of things have come about in whiskey, uh, how things came to be. And often when you read into it and you discover things, you, it's not often what you imagined, it's not what you expected. For us, we look at single malt and everything that's available to us today, and we think that it's been there forever. Well, I'm going to take us back to the 1980s and the launch of these six bottles that's over my left shoulder here, the original Diageo, or UDV as it was back then, six classic malts, and talk about those bottles for a little while, talk about uh, what they did for the whiskey landscape back then, and kind of ask a few questions about their validity based on the current kind of whiskey scape, whiskey landscape. Anyway, that's the idea. That's a loose theme for tonight. But of course, this is the VPUB. So anything goes, give me your uh, mentions in the chat. Try and get my attention by at Aquavite. I'll just type Aquavite and I should see it here highlighted in orange and I should be able to interact with you from time to time as a drop-in. A bit later on in the show tonight, I'm going to reach out to Andy at Maltbox, my friend Andy from down south, who's a wee bit worried that he might end up on lockdown again soon, the localised lockdown, but he's not yet. Certainly, that's no problem with him joining here tonight. He's going to talk about the upcoming English Whiskey Festival, which is, I think is a really cool thing. He's going to join me to talk about the classic malts, and he's also going to... Um, make reparations for not playing Is It A Space Side the last time he was on. He was supposed to be involved in a game of Is It A Space Side. It was actually my fault the way the run and work that night. I forgot to have Andy partake. And since it's only him and I that's on tonight, we're going to do one each. We're going to take a turn around. So there'll be a chance for two of you to, to earn one of the sniper coins, one of the clear uh, glass topper sniper coins that can only be one. They can't be purchased or, or anything. The only way to get your hands on one is to actually win it. So you can come on the show and you can play Is It A Space Side? You just get in touch with me directly at whiskey at aquavite.com. The email's working again. Thank you all for your patience. I have lost a bunch of emails, um, but uh, I've been managed to uh, recover a lot more than I expected. But the, the email's working again, whiskey at aquavite.com. If you want to come on and play live, but you can always always play in the chat and the lounge with everybody else. Uh, you play along and the first person to answer uh, will win a sniper coin tonight. Since it's myself and another YouTube creator that's doing it, it's the first two answers. So I hope uh, my moderators, my uh, helpers in the chat can help me manage that. I want to say a huge thanks to Bill Monteith for buying me uh, a virtual dram before we went live tonight. Um, and also whiskey novice Jim Ingram over in Northern Ireland, who's uh, changed his, his uh, artwork there. So it's going to take me a while to tune into his new red logo there saying, can't hang around, mate, but just wanted to pop in and say hello. Have a good one, and I'll see you in the rerun. Jim Ingram and Bill Monteith, thank you so much for your virtual drams. Lovely to welcome you in, boys, whether it's now or on the replay. Cheers. Thank you. Let's jump into the lounge and welcome some of you dedicated barflies and beautiful whiskey folk. Actually, I want to go back and mention uh, some of the people I was getting set up and ready here. And there was a lot of people in nice and early. Steve A was the first in the door. Nice to have you, Steve, is always looking after me, as you always do. But also, Cresimir was back, the sniper king. I, heard, I read that he'd, he'd sprained his ankle. I hope you're in not too much pain. And maybe a wee dram, Cresimir, is helping you get through that as well. But there was a hell of a lot of you in early. And I think what I've, I'm going to start doing is maybe take a wee screen grab because I'm scrolling back. Uh, and the chat is moving so fast that I've already lost the early pre-VPUB door opening. 
chats. But thanks so much for joining early. The chat is live before the VPUB goes live. So if you want to start hanging out with your fellow barflies and having a wee chat beforehand, it's absolutely fine to do that. I welcome it. But let's see who's in tonight. Mark, good to see you, Mark. Precarious Dave saying evening all. Ted B, Pete Head, uh, David Parks. Good to have you, David. Jimmy Leg, my friend Jimmy Blair, of course. Fantastic. Mikey Hay from down south in London, Mikey. Hope you're doing very, very well, my friend. Uh, David Anderson is in. Kilted Moose Scott is in. Let's raise a wee glass to Scott, actually. Kilted Moose, a wee bird tells me that he's going through a wee change of career, and today was his last day. Uh, a music journalist, he, he's telling us, he was sharing the fact that he's written 12,000 musical uh, journal as uh, a uh, sorry, articles in his uh, career as a music journalist. Uh, he's staying in the industry, but he's changing roles and he's off to New Horizons. So raise a wee glass for our friend and fellow Glasgow bottle chaser, Kilted Moose Scott Monroe. I wish you all the best, Scott. Well done. Good to have you in as well. Frank is here, Pete Head. Wonderful to have you. Shane Lay is in. Great to have you as well, Shane. Radek is here. Good to have you back, my friend. The one glass man. That's Warner from the States. Always a pleasure to have you in. I hope your son, Warner, is doing very well as well, my friend. Lee J. Brown is in. Good to have met with you on Sunday night, Lee J. Uh, we had a speakeasy Zoom session for patrons. It was clunky and messy. I got some things right. I got some things wrong. But it's pretty hard to kind of manage a... Uh, uh, you know, a video conferencing style thing when there's uh, there were 65 or so people in on Sunday night. Uh, but it was wonderful just to put faces to names and see happy faces and see people kind of meeting each other for the first time. But I need to develop that. I need to refine it so it can be a wee bit more slicker and it can bring value to everybody that's involved. But thank you all for joining me on Sunday night. I got a great, uh, a, a good laugh out, out of it. And it was a kick to hang out with you of a Sunday evening. We'll try and do it better in the future. Donald Rance is here. Great to see you, Donald. Nick Keane, he was there on Sunday night as well, down in New Zealand. Wonderful to see you, Nick. I hope Penny's doing very well. Uh, Kunur, a connoisseur, is in. Uh, good to have you back again, my friend. And Tony Evans is here. Tony, you've been here, along with Whiskey Jason, Jez Batty, and a few other guys. You've been here literally since day one. And I want to thank you from very, very sincerely for that. It's so reassuring to look in the chat and see people that aren't fed up of this yet. <laughs> Thank you, Tony, for your patience and your support, my friend. Cheers. Glad I caught you tonight. Blair Stevenson is in. Fellow Scott, good to have you, Blair. Wonderful to have you in. Simon Ray is here. Whiskey Straight, Al from Northern Ireland. Brilliant to have you, Al. Uh, uh, oh, chat jump. Stuart Whiskey Wims is in. Looks like he's still offshore. I was going to ask Stuart in for a wee game of Is It A Space Side? Uh, but we tried these connection and it was just a wee bit too ropey. So next week, week after, whenever it's appropriate, Stuart's going to jump in and challenge me to a wee game of Is It A Space Side? Uh, lots of orange. I was missing it all. Pete Head, Frank is saying, even Roy, good to see you again. Good to see you, Frank. Uh, Alexander is in. Great timing from Irish Whiskey Society, tasting right into an Aqua Vitae VPUB. I know there's so much content on there just now. Um, I wonder if uh, if the VPUB is ever stepping on anyone's toes. I hope not. Matt Whiskey Games is in. Uh, Matt Bishop, good to see you, Matt. I matured from being a sprightly 10-year-old to a well-rounded 20-year-old in the 1980s. Um, aye, you're just maybe a nudge or two older than me then, Matt. It was, uh, I hit my 20s in 1990. Desi's in. It was great to meet you on Sunday night as well, Desi. A pleasure to have you there. Same good evening. Carl Van Wallingham is in. Good to have you back, my friend. Great to see you. And Welsh Toro is in. Always a pleasure, Welsh, to see that wee icon in the chat room. Jimmy Legg, of course. Blair Conrad is here. Menno's multi-mission. Uh, Luna Aaron and Stewie Baby. Great to have you all. I hope you're doing well, Stewie and Luna. Um, listen, I know it's pretty difficult for me to interact with everybody, but Hopefully tonight is going to be uh, relaxed enough for me to be able to jump into the chat, in and out of the chat quite regularly. I have been, uh, let's see, criticised in the past for being a bit supportive, bit of a fanboy, but partisan towards Diageo and Diageo products and Diageo distilleries. I'd like to just address that. Uh, there is no affiliation between me and any producer that exists on the planet. I think everybody knows that. 
but I'm a human, so inevitably I end up with favourites and I end up following roads that take me along familiar ways. So I, I explore distilleries that I enjoy and I mine other expressions from there to try and, uh, you know, have more positive experiences with the distilleries. But I don't care who owns that distillery. It's just a footnote to me. And the, the corporate entity that's at the top means nothing, honestly. It is just something that we need to know and be aware of. For me, it's about the whiskey, and that means it's about the distillery, and it's about the people that's making that whiskey at the, that distillery. And it's about that location and the spirit that it produces and how it lives up to its uh, the product that it, that it distills. How does that end up in the bottle? How much of the, the quality that's put into making the spirit is presented when it's put out for sale? That's the things that I care about. In time, I discovered that a lot of the distilleries that I was really, really enjoying and was drawn to, incidentally, coincidentally, were Diageo-owned distilleries. Now, that shouldn't be a surprise. Diageo owned 28 distilleries, 28 malt distilleries. So they cover a lot of the landscape out there. But if we think about Lagavulin, if we think about Talisker, if we think about Klein Leash, and so, so many other wonderful distilleries, maybe more under the radar ones like Benrinis and Dal Ewan, uh, even the Strath Mills and the Thrusks and the Teninix, and these are all Diageo distilleries. And, and yes, most of them are existing because at the end of the day, Diageo, the parent company, what their focus is the blended market. It's a massive market. They're producing firmly focused on blends. And yet, since 1988 and certainly early 90s, they've been releasing, uh, at one point, they were the only producer that was releasing malt from all their operational malt distilleries. That's Other producers have done that since, but not consistently, not like Diageo have. The only one that we don't have a malt from right now is Rosail, and that's because Rosail's this pretty big concern that is set up to make any whiskey that Diageo could possibly want, honestly. So, you know, that idea of kind of having a specific style, that, that's not kind of what Rosile is about. But you never know, we might see a single malt from Rosile. I kind of hope we do. Um, but yes, they have this huge presence, this huge market share. And being that the size that they are, they can sometimes do things and make decisions and kind of get on our nerves a little bit. And that can be hard. For me, I always come at it from the whiskey perspective. And it just so happens that that producer, that parent company, have a lot of great distilleries. Don't think that this is a Diageo advert tonight. That's not what this is about. This is me talking about something that happened in 1988. And in the context of the, the 80s and the single malt landscape at that time, it was quite a big deal. They didn't know it was a big deal at the time because they had false starts launching malt whiskies before that. But in 1988, these six whiskies were launched and it was a concept that was new to even the most dedicated whiskey drinkers. We'll talk a wee bit more about that. Donald Rance is saying, I think we can be guilty of being fanboys, absolutely. As long as the stuff inside the bottle is quality, then it shouldn't matter. The Craigenmore 2019 LE is quickly becoming one of my favourites. Wow. So that's the, the limited edition from 2019. That's probably one of the special releases of Craigenmore. Special releases for me are, are can often just be out of my price range. It's just They're just too expensive to connect with. And even when you get offered kind of samples of them or things like that, um, it, it's kind of nice, but it's not. It's nice if you can enjoy a sample with a view to potentially fulfilling uh, a longer term relationship with that whiskey by buying a bottle. But for me, so many of the special releases for Diageo um, have changed over the years and become more and more expensive each release. So I'm going to focus more on the kind of uh, grassroots type whiskies. And Danny McKinley saying, no need to justify your enjoyment. I feel you come across very genuine at all times. I do try my best, Danny, but I'm, I'm just as likely as anybody to falter 
uh, from time to time. But we try. I have a Glen Spey independent bottle in the glass right now from a Sherry Cask Aquavitis' Whiskey Weekend Dram. Um, it's a nice whiskey and not that common. Tasted this blind and had to buy a bottle. That's great. Listen, I've got a couple of Glen Elgins here. Sorry, it was a Glen Spey you had. Glen Spey was the thing uh, that... Uh, I got Roddy on last year to talk about uh, whiskey distilleries that are just kind of flying under the radar that you forget about, and Glen Spey is one of those. Um, it's rare to see Glen Spey, even as a, an, an independent bottler, and as from Diageo, you can only get it as flora and fauna. Glad you're enjoying it, though. Um, I bet it is quite nice. <laughs> Nick Keen is saying, I have a dog here called Whiskey, and she's watching the V-Pub with me. She's getting very confused. <laughs> I should say Whiskey in a New Zealand accent. See how she goes. Uh, Radek is saying uh, Aquavite Facebook page and uh, send me your vlog info. Ah, okay, so it's just been highlighted to me. There is a Barfly page. Uh, there's an Aquavite Water Life Facebook page. Um, it's just kind of another place for me to share uh, videos and what's happening with Aquavite. Inside the Barflies page, I share no videos whatsoever. That's where the community gather and get together. That's where I hope that friendships and connections are happening. And if you're going to a distillery or a festival or an event or a tasting or a meeting or whatever it is, you can uh, get together. That's that kind of idea that you take the virtual world and render it real by meeting up in real life. Uh, so you can join the Facebook Barfly page there as well. Peter Hunt is saying, Aquavide, my first distillery tour was Glen Kinchy, so I'll always have a soft spot for it. I echo Tamitha Adams' though, comment, good whiskey is good whiskey, no matter what. That's what we certainly chase. Where is the good liquid coming from? There might be other reasons that we choose to uh, connect or not connect with producers or distilleries, but first and foremost for me, of course, it's the obvious thing. It's about... Uh, it's about the whiskey. Sniper King, Kresimir Jelchitz. He's won, um, I think, six or seven. I think it's seven Sniper coins he's managed to win. And he hasn't appeared on the show yet. Kresimir, maybe you should come on and do it live and see how you go on, see how the Sniper King would do live. He's saying, Aquavite, I think the majority of people started their journey with these six. At least I have. I think that's what I want to focus on as well. That idea that a lot of us have passed these by. There's not a lot of interest in here. For a lot of the enthusiasts, let's say, that are mature in their whiskey journey, they've kind of moved past these. So I want to kind of evaluate their validity, where they fit, who they speak to. Certainly for me, I'm the same as you, Chris Amir. I, I loved these. I loved exploring these when I first started out in whiskey for a lot of reasons that I hope we can touch on. Hellswood is saying, you're a fanboy? Surely not. As long as I admit it, then you can use your own rational intelligence when I start to rave about certain things. Daniel Gray saying, Aquavite, they're important whiskies just because they are produced by a, uh, but just because they are produced by a large company doesn't um, lessen that. They are responsible for getting a lot of people into whiskey. For me, it was the Dilwini. Do you know what? That Dilwini is a 15 year old product. 15 years old, and I think it's about £40 I paid for that bottle that's sitting up there. 43%, yes, it's coloured and things, but a 15-year-old age statement. And, and honestly, quite a good, sweet, easy and accessible Highland whiskey for not a lot of money. These are good value as well. Lagavulin 16 as well. The retail for that is £60-ish. You can often pick it up much cheaper than that. I think in the States it's about $90, $100. For a 16-year-old Isla, Again, I know it's coloured 43%, but that's the, one of the most powerful whiskey small ambassadors that's ever existed, that Lagavulin like 16. The amount of people that that's converted to loving malt whiskey is quite incredible. Um, and for me, it's always going to have a soft spot. For me, Tony Evans is saying that when he started my interest in the mid-80s, very interesting. Vicky Thompson is saying we started our journey eight-ish years ago with Glen Kinchy and only just killed that original bottle recently. I dismissed Glen Kinchy for a while when I first started to enjoy malt whiskey. Glen Kinchy was plain, vanilla, soft, subtle, boring even to me. And I needed somebody to show me the light. I needed to spend a bit of time with it. And I've come to love it now. Terry Dolan is in Terry. You start no comment, but he's bought me a virtual dram, Terry from Northern Ireland. Um, it's always a pleasure to have you in, Terry. Thanks for joining. I hope that you're getting involved in some way in the upcoming Bastards Ball on the 12th of September, which unfortunately for us all this year, the Whiskey Tribe event has to be virtual. 
but we should be able to still have a bit of fun. Cheers, Terry. Thank you. And Helen is saying Lagavulin is still some dram. An epiphany dram for so many barflies. Still a fave in our collection. Okay, I'll tell you what I'm sipping right now. I've started with the Kragenmore. Um, now, a lot of people, I think, with the six classic waltz would start with either Glen Kinchy or the Dawini. But I'm starting with this one. And uh, the interesting label description here says that an elegant, sophisticated space side with the most complex aroma of any malt. Well, you know, I don't want to disagree with whoever wrote that, but to me, it could be true of Craigenmore as a whiskey, but I don't think that's true of this bottling of Craigenmore. I've had this a long time. Um, it's soft. That's the problem. One of the best whiskies I've ever had was a Craigenmore, but it was a private cask. And it was up at a tasting in Ballandalic. It was wonderful, wonderful stuff. 28 years old. Cast strength and just nectar. Just amazing, amazing stuff. This, this is like Craig and Moore for beginners, absolutely. It's 40%. It's kind of soft. It's very easy to drink. It is very elegant. That descriptor here is accurate. And it's easy to enjoy. It's easy to drink. I would even go as far to say it is a wee bit moorish. So if you're just sitting in social company and you're not really focusing on the whiskey, this is fine. But I think as your journey moves along, very, very quickly, you're going to find this soft and dull. Perfect to start a flight, perfect to get your palate in the right place for whiskey, all of those things that we use these kind of whiskies for. But to me, not much more. Certainly not when it says complex on the label. But it's still good value, honestly. It's, again, £40 for a 12-year-old single malt whiskey. And honestly, if you want to try this and you're going to recognise a theme with these whiskies that I'm talking about tonight, you have to try them from Diageo as official bottlings. You're not going to see many Craig and Moores from an independent bottler. You're not going to see Talisker, Dolwini, Oban. Occasionally you might see Lagavulin, but not much of it. And certainly not Glen Kinchy. You're just not going to get a hold of these anywhere outside of these ranges. So it's difficult to connect with the real product that's actually uh, coming out of mature casks. And I think that's a wee bit of a shame. I understand why. And part of the reason why, it's not just about the blends, it's about how successful these have been as a malt. There's not a lot of it going around. That's why I've started with the Craig and More tonight. And that's why it would be normally the one that I start on. The Dawani is very light, very honeyed, very sweet. I'm going to skip that one tonight. I'm not going to open that one. But I'm going to open the Glen Kinchy. Now, this is dangerous. This is risky and dodgy. Uh, this is not my bottle of Glen Kinchy. This belongs to my cousin, Kevin Grant. He's uh, he's doing his own thing on YouTube, Kev Grant on Whiskey. Um. Uh, I, I know a lot of you have, have recently subscribed to him after he was on the show, but he, he gave this to me months and months ago, way before lockdown. And the idea was that we'd get together and we'd open this together. But this is an original 1980s Glen Kinchy. There's no barcode or anything on this. Um, there's a good chance that this, with uh, the labelling on it and the fact that it's a 10-year age statement, not a 12 as it is today, um, still 43%, you'll see that uh, this is an older style label, very similar to the, to the bottling today, uh, but slightly different. Uh, Kevin's not here tonight, but I've, I've checked in with him and he's quite happy for me to open this. Uh, he tried to open it. You might see that that's a broken cork, a damaged cork. And he's had bad experiences in the past with a couple of corked whiskies and he panicked that this was the same. You'll notice the fill levels dropped in this. That in itself isn't a problem. Uh, but it, it does suggest that the cork has been uh, leaking a wee bit. Oxidization isn't bad, but what we don't want is any cork contamination. And all, we also want to be able to get what's left of that cork <laughs> without any cork going into the whiskey. So I've got my uh, bottle opener, and I can't believe I'm trying this live. Um, and it will try and retrieve this broken cork. Now, there's a lot of chat about broken corks. 
Uh, a lot of people don't have any problem with them. They don't seem to have a lot of broken corks. But if you're going to auctions and buying old whiskies, if you're uh, going to independent bottlers and things, this is this is very soft, this cork. You will eventually have problems with corks. So keep your spare corks. Keep them in a wee drawer or a box somewhere because you might need to use them in the future. You will have problems with natural cork at some point. Let's try and take this out. It's very soft. It's just breaking. But it might come. It's disintegrating, unfortunately. So even if there's going to be bits of cork in the whiskey tonight, I don't have anything to filter it. You can use a coffee filter. You can use a tea strainer or even a fine sieve or whatever it is. You can pour it through. Just decant it into something glass and then sieve it and re-decant it back into the bottle as well. But you can see that that cork, um, if I turn it around the other way, you can see it's just literally disintegrating. So let's see if we can get out most of it. That's not bad, not bad at all. There you go. I'm quite pleased with that and I've got plenty of corks down there that I can get a cork back in this. But now of course we're hoping that it's going to be okay. Um, Whiskey Straight Alice saying it's all about the facial expressions. <laughs> Precarious David saying hands and pliers now. Multi-mission is saying the future will be 3D printing corks. Absolutely. So what's the chances of this being corked? The cork was dry at least. Smells old, smells very old. For anybody that's familiar with antique bottles of whiskey, they have something called old bottle effect. And it's kind of dank, dungy, old spirit smell. And it's here. Doesn't smell vegetal. It doesn't smell like rotten potato or turnip, which suggests cork taint. Smells okay in the bottle. <sighs> Smells really nice, actually, really nice. Still a lot of kind of elegance, delicate, soft fruit, very ripe, soft. Think of like a nice syrupy poached pear or something like that. Vanilla, but quiet vanilla. Wee bit cereal. Modern Glen Kinchy for me is, is much more kind of a cereal and grassy and um, it's, mu it's much more of a texture experience. This this is richer on the nose. So much to do with oxida oxidation in the bottle probably or let's just say uh, the chemistry of it just sitting in glass for, for 32 years. Anyway, let's have a, a wee sip. This uh, whiskey's been waiting a long time Kevin, thank you very much for the bottle. Um, I look forward to having you down to have a wee dram of it soon. Cheers. Oh, wow. Much more spice than expected. Completely different animal from the Craig and Moore I've just been sipping. Completely different. It's not even the same sport. Not much richer. Lots of spice. There's a lot more sherry cask in this, I think. Long finish. I have to say, I have to say that's quite uh, impressive. I'm very relieved that it is not corked in any way. I have to apologise. What would have been great would, would be to have a modern Glen Kinchy to compare it alongside and have the two side by side tonight. But I, I made a bit of a mistake when I was ordering the missing pieces for the collection here. I didn't. I thought I'd ordered a Glen Kinchy, but I didn't. But maybe one day in the future, I think that would be a good thing to do. One of the topics I've got for VPUBs coming up in the future is comparing contemporary whiskies to their antique counterparts. I think it'd be an interesting thing. Uh, maybe send out some sets so that other people can sip along as well. Um, so maybe we'd get to something like that. But this is really nice and moorish. Oh yeah, Ke Kevin, you'll be pleased to know that this is a good dram 
and despite the level dropping, it stayed fresh over the years. Sid Martin is in. Good to see you, Sid. Saying Aquavita, I get mineral water note on current Glen Kinchy 12. Very subtle and delicate. I like it. Um, that's interesting. Mineral water. So that's a kind of mineralic thing, like uh, like an Anok thing or something like that. Kevin Grant, no, Kevin is here. Uh, Aquavita, do you think the cork has ruined anything about the whiskey? Absolutely not. I think we're in good shape. I think the only thing that we're tasting here is, is old bottle effect. Um, there's a wee bit of bitterness, but it's nothing to do with the cork. I think it's just to do with the whiskey. This is one that you're going to be able to, to drink, buddy, no problem. Rob Halford is here saying, I could be to Fenny, I'll catch you on an episode live. Just enjoying the Glen Kinchy 12 tonight. So good timing. Yeah, I should have some of yours so we could compare this to that. That would be amazing. Uh, Nick Keen is saying, is it just me or is Roy's camera focused on the background instead of him? It could be. There's not a lot of uh, let's uh, let's have something up close that it can focus on. I don't know if that helps at all, Nick. Uh, but the webcam being what it is, I've tried other solutions. This is the most simple. I hope you can see me okay. Uh, if I'm a wee bit blurry, it's probably better for most folk. Picares Davis saying, "Great idea. I have a poor Buna having twelve from before." Burn Stewart, 40%. Well, that would have been Burn Stewart, even back at 40%. But before they made the changes, 46.3, um, absolutely. Uh, I have I don't have it, but a friend of mine still has some of that. And the uh, Tobamori 10 at 40% as well. Um, how many whiskies have improved? I think it's all too easy to forget just how much, uh, just how many whiskies have improved quite a lot. Jimmy Legg is saying the Glen Kinchy 12 is the closest thing to heavy cream I've had in whiskey. Yes, it's that lovely, almost cooling. I know that cold isn't a flavour, but there's a cooling effect in a lot of whiskies. Um, sometimes you articulate it as menthol or eucalyptus or these kind of things. Um, and I'm not suggesting that Glen Kinchy tastes of those, but there is something oily and heavy in Glen Kinchy for me. Um, it has to be pointed out, and often it has to be sipped in contrast with something else for you to, to feel it and taste it. But, Jimmy, uh, I get you completely, and I agree. Hoyt is saying, I like the Glen Kinchy Distillers Edition. Um, it's it's kind of tough to get the Distillers Editions. They're not always available. I think it's a fairly limited release. Chris Beaton is in. Good to see you, Chris. Hi, folks, and hi, Roy, as well as Matthew multi -Haggis Muncher. Good to see you, buddy. Um, Daniel Grace saying, can't blame the webcam for wanting to show off the, that collection. <laughs> Daniel, <laughs> nice one. Jean de la Cuisine is saying, a bit blurry is no problem. I'm here for the accent. There you go. That's an interesting one. Um, what's your accent, John? Where are you? Is it the Netherlands you are? I can't remember. Ebhead from Norway is saying, I noticed some sulfur in the Kinchy 12. The tour guide admitted that they go for a sulfurate new make. Anyone with me on this? A lot of times we attribute sulfur to being a, a less than adequate sherry cask. We talk about uh, disinfecting of the cask and sulfur candles and all those nasty, nasty sulfur things. I think a lot of it is down to Jim Murray, honestly. Um, but we get distracted and if we taste sulfur in whiskey, we think it's a, from a dodgy sherry cask. Sulfur can be in the grain. Sulfur can come into the whiskey from the process. Sulfur is actively harvested by the distiller in a lot of distilleries. Probably Glen Kinchy. Think of Mortlach and so many other distilleries as well that actively go for a sulfury, heavy, full-bodied um, style of malt. And if you are, if they are actively going for a, a sulfury new make, it's nothing to do with sulfur in the cask. It's a completely different kind of sulfur. Um, and yeah, the next time I have a Glen Kinchy, I don't, I'm not getting much sulfur in this. Until you suggest it. <laughs> this is so much richer and more sherry. Very interesting to I'm a wee bit frustrated that I don't have a contemporary one to sip alongside. But yes, absolutely loving uh, the Glen Kinchy 12 from the 1980s. Sorry, Glen Kinchy 10. It's 10 years old from back then. And I think it's a bit of a treasure. It's really nice to have this kind of little piece of history. Transport yourself back to the 1980s. 
what were you doing? Were you even born then? <laughs> Potentially not. The classic malts could be older than a lot of people watching this uh, stream. But in the 1980s, there wasn't a lot of malt selection, honestly speaking. You know, maybe you had a specialist near you that could get you some Gordon and McPhail bottlings or Caden heads or something like this. But there wasn't even a lot of independent bottlers about back then. The 1980s was pretty bleak and it was bleak for Scotch whiskey industry in general. It wasn't fashionable and distilleries were getting closed right, left and centre and we ended up with the whiskey loch. Laphroaig was around. Glenlivet was around. And of course, the original from the early 60s, Glenfiddich, was around as well, selling single malt or pure malt. In time, others would follow. McAllen started, I think, in the late 70s. So by the time the classic malts were launched in 88, McAllen had probably been around for about 10 years by that time. But think about that. McAllen, even McAllen, the great, the mighty, the instantly recognisable brand that McAllen has become, was very, very young, and it's still a, a young brand compared to whiskey generally as a single malt. McAllen has been bottled as a single malt much, much longer than the late 70s, yes, but it's been very, very small batch. There was no aggressive marketing or anything behind it, like so many other malt whiskies that existed. Glenfiddich changed all of that, and soon to follow would be Glenlivet and Glenmorangie, Laphroaig. There were a few whiskies out there. Lagavulin at that time would have been an eight-year-old product as well. Again, limited quantities. Then in 1988, after a few false starts, like I say, they decide, or uh, UDV at the time, what we'll just refer to them as Diageo as they're known now, um, they decided that they would, they would bring this six malt whiskies out onto the market to showcase variation and different flavour pro profiles in Scotch malt whisky. So many people just considered whisky as whisky. It was just this generic brown liquid with a generic whisky flavour. Even whisky drinkers, even whisky drinkers in Scotland, wouldn't have been able to tell you the difference between a blend and a malt. In time, they would come to know these other bottles as malt, and they would refer to them as malt whisky. But never before had somebody seen a display of those six bottles and been forced to ask themselves or perhaps whoever's responsible for pouring behind the bar why the six bottles are lined up on a plinth like that. I've got a picture here that I'll try to show you. Uh, there we go. I'm just trying to show you that image there. Up the top here, we've got the original 1988 six classic malts. And then directly underneath it, we've got the six modern versions of the classic malts. And you can see in 32 years, the packaging has changed very, very little. They're instantly recognisable as each other. It's quite an amazing thing. That's quite a consistent thing in whisky that has been going for that long. And it still looks and feels very much the same from an aesthetic and a branding perspective anyway. So you can imagine seeing that plinth and suddenly you start to think and suddenly you start to buy and explore and try to and realise that you've got a favoured malt profile. You've got a style of whisky that perhaps you really quite enjoy. And you start to ask about why Lagavulin is so heavy and smoky and salty and iodine -y. And you start to wonder what that texture is in the Glen Kinchy. You start to wonder what the salt and pepper and spice is on Talisker. Are you genuinely tasting coastal salinity? All of these these fun and crazy things. Back in the 80s, I know that we are whiskey enthusiasts today and it's it's second nature to us, but back in the 80s, that was, that was a new concept. It really was. When they were launched, they were seen as being premium and they were more expensive than the blends that they went alongside, but they were not ridiculously expensive. They were affordable and people could buy them and take them home. The end result was that it was very, very successful. So successful that throughout the 90s, these built a head of steam that forced their distilleries on allocation in a lot of uh, cases. Lagavulin got locked down on allocation and it was really, really tough to manage the, what was required for blends and what was required for Lagavulin as a single malt. At times, it disappeared. So this was a very, very successful concept and one that would be copied by Seagram's and copied by allied distillers. 
with much less success and much less longevity, but they would start to do the same things. And in time, the six original classic malts got extended. And now there's another half a dozen classic malts on top of these, such as Glen Elgin and Klein Leash and Kalila, Nukandu. Oh, I'm trying to think what else we have. Cardu is an extended malt range as well. Um, I know that I'm forgetting another one, but it's been extended, and that's down to the success of the original six classic malts. So let's move on. Let's uh, open up Oban. This is where I would go next. This is their coastal representation, Glen Kinchy's their, their lowland entry. Dilwyn is their highland, typical highland entry. Craig and Moore is their Speyside. Oban is their coastal highland. Talisker is their island highland. And of course, Lagavulin is their smoky isla. This is one of my favorite, genuinely one of my favorite whiskies. It's available everywhere. You can find it in bars all over the place. It's very ubiquitous and it's very, very consistent. I hope you can hear that amazing noise. Let me pop them back up here. <laughs> Just have a wee smell of this. We'll leave it here for a minute, let it open up a little bit. It's absolutely just out the neck. The reason I've opened the open is because that's the one I'm most keen to have open again on the cabinet. Um, I enjoy this whiskey, I enjoy it a lot. It's one of these, um, yes, it's only 43%. It could be doing with it being a wee bit higher, but at least it's better than the Craigamore, which is sitting at a lowly 40. This is clean, elegant, complex. I would argue more complex than the Craigamore, just to my palate, honestly. It has much more body about it. It has that tiny, tiny little bit of of rich weight that's maybe uh, missing on the likes of the Crag and Moor and maybe arguably even the Glen Kinchy. It's just a much more intriguing malt. And when you sip it alongside the other ones that we've had beforehand, that's when you pick that out. Now, yes, this is going to be coloured as well, and at 43%, it's going to be chill filtered. Dry, drier than I remembered and expected. Lovely spice again. Easy, very approachable, rich. How I wish 46% I would take, 48% even better. Can you imagine the fun you would have with with whiskey with malt of this quality at that ABV. Like 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 they do for their Klein Leash, they put their Klein Leash out at 46%. I wish they did it with more. I wish that there was more preservation in the malt category. I wish that whiskey was just whiskey. And if you were going to blend your whiskey, yeah, colour it, yeah, chill filter it, it's mass market, whatever you want to do, that's whiskey, Scotch whiskey. That's what is whiskey. But if it's malt whiskey, no, you cannot. You write malt on the bottle. You don't need to write blended malt. This is just malt whiskey. And that gives you a guarantee that it is not chill filtered, that it is not colored, that it is natural color. That we tell people the age of the malt whiskey. We give it what it deserves. And if you want to define the category further by branding it or whatever, fine, you can call it a single malt and get have differentiation between generic or Let's say malt whiskey can be a blend or teaspoon or whatever it may be. It could be that the brand is hidden or whatever. And then if you want to define it further, you have single malt. But any malt whiskey sold for malt's sake shouldn't be, it shouldn't have anything added to it. Certainly shouldn't have anything added to it without you telling, telling you on the label. But just shouldn't have anything added and it shouldn't have anything taken away. Blends, fine. Mass market, we understand. But malt, come on, it's doing a different thing. That's the problem with the classic malts. The classic malts were launched to a blended market who were used to drinking at 40% ABV. They didn't care about if there was colour and 
added to the whiskey. Whiskey was a brown liquid. That's what they expected. 40% ABV was where it, was where it was at, and they didn't want it clouding or going misty when they were having it cold with a lemonade or with pouring it over ice or whatever it may be. So it was doctored and it was played with. And these malt whiskies were released onto that marketplace and so started to be presented the same way as what the marketplace was used to. And we still have that legacy today. Unfortunately, it's the same on flora and fauna. God, what a waste. Can you imagine how amazing flora and fauna would be at 46% natural presentation, natural colour? And and I don't I know that some of these are genuinely not filtered and not coloured and things like that. But unless it says on the label, unless somebody steps up and tells us. Uh, Matthias Mulder, good to have you in, Matthias. He's saying Aquavita, I always get orange peel and Oban. Aye, I'll give you your orange peel, absolutely, Matthias. Even though I tasted quite a few whiskies, Oban takes me back to when I tasted it for the first time. Orange and orange peel is an Aran thing for me, so I guess not very far. It's quite sweet orange, almost a syrupy orange. But there is orange there, Matthias. We can't find where the dock is in Aquaviti. I took the posh tour at Oban. They had interesting cask strength expressions. I bet you they would be great as well, Doc. Maybe need to take a wee trip up to Oban. I can take the train to Oban. There's really no excuse, apart from perhaps the current climate. Jean-Paul van der Hoven is in. Good to see you, Jean-Paul. He said, do you think these malts are still good representations for their regions? Regionality, we will, and, and regions and whiskey regions, that's a different discussion altogether. But in the modern world, um, we're not really in the kind of uh, supplying malt whiskey for uh, uh, an ingredients cabinet for a blender. It's not like that anymore. So we, you know, the individual distillery characters and the regional uh, characters and that's still a very useful dynamic, especially when you're coming into whiskey, to understand what a classic space either a classic Highlander or or, or whatever it might be, but all distilleries are capable of making all whiskies now, and we're seeing that with the new whiskies that are coming along, they're really able to set up and make any kind of expression that they like. Modern infrastructure in place, they can get grain from anywhere, they can have it peated or non-peated. Really, it's uh, it's down to the, they're only limited by their own imagination and obviously the, the regulations. So I would say there is still some representation here but as the years tick by, the, that is becoming thinner and more tenuous over time. However, it's still good to have that anchor there to suggest that maybe this is a typical Speyside style or Highland or whatever it may be. And maybe, arguably, they are. I think that Talisker and Oban are good island coastal style malts. Like Villain is certainly a good representation of Isla. Come on. That Dalwini, I think, is the sweeter, honeyer end of the Highlands, honestly. I like my Highlands to be sometimes a bit drier, a bit more complex. Glen Kinchy, usually a lowland style would have been uh, traditionally, historically, maybe more kind of light, triple distilled style. But Glen is still light enough to, to be there, absolutely. So yes, in a very loose sense, I would say, uh, absolutely, Jan Paul. Whiskey Wim Stewart is saying, got to go to bed, mate. He's out in Norway, I think, or he's offshore somewhere. I think he's offshore. Have a good one. Here's a wee jam, and I'll get you a physical one someday. I will. I'll see you on the show soon. You're coming on to challenge us, uh, Stuart, for a wee game of Is It a Space Side? In the meantime, uh, stay safe out there, and I hope you get home safe, Stuart. Thank you for the jam, my friend. Cheers. This is coming really nice. This is becoming more and more enjoyable. Glenn Duncan is saying, I don't fully understand colouring. How much is added as a percent in a 700ml bottle? Uh, if it's not added, does the whiskey taste different? That's a whole can of worms there, right there, Glenn. Um, I've done a VPUB on adding colouring. Generally, we're told that there's only a kind of dot added to each bottle, and it's not added, obviously. It's added at the bottling plant. It's added en masse. It's a huge thing. Um, but I've got some... I had it out recently, the caramel colouring. Um, and it's it's horrible stuff. It's really, really horrible. Um and I think once you've got a heavily coloured whiskey in front of you, if you can't taste it, it's easy 
to convince yourself that you can and that's enough. I think I can taste it. And heavily coloured whiskies, I think I can taste it. And some hev heavily coloured whiskies, I think I can taste it to the point that it's off-putting. It's not nice. And if you've ever just had it on your fingers and tasted it, the, ta the taste doesn't leave you. It stays with you for a long, long time. And it's off-putting. So there you go. That's us. We've got as far as the Oban. Last week's VPUB was recommending a whiskey collection, trying to keep it to less than £250. For a beginner, speaking to your formal self, self back at the start of your whiskey journey, whatever it may be. And the obvious question is, would I recommend these for that? Because you can buy all six of these. The whole collection that you see there, you can buy for less than £250, or let's say around £250, depending on where you get it from. So that's interesting. I'm not sure I would be in a hurry to recommend the Craganmore, but I'm sure that if I did recommend and they bought the Craganmore, they would be very, very happy with it, a beginner. Absolutely. The Glen Kinchy maybe would be a bit too subtle for them, but I think they would still enjoy it. And the Oban, I'm pretty sure that they would enjoy it, and they would start to get that idea of sipping in contrast. These do fit into that remit. Now, they don't have the presentation that we want, and that's kind of the point I'm making here. Things are changing, consumers are changing, we're becoming much more demanding. We should be more demanding, especially when it comes to malt whiskey, if I haven't made that point clear. I think better presented product would do better in the, in the modern whiskey landscape. This whiskey over my shoulder is not struggling to sell. There is a reason that we don't see it in independent bottlers. It's doing very, very, very well. But it's a stepping stone, it's a bridge product. And as soon as we get into whiskey, uh, a whiskey journey, let's say we become a bit more enthusiastic about whiskey and we follow whiskey more closely, we start to leave that whiskey behind. And that's a shame because we could keep it and take it with us if it was better presented. And the market of that enthusiast, that informed market is the one that's swelling. That's the one that's growing, the premium market. And I think that um, if Diageo are going to, start to tweak or modify or rebrand, I hope that it's less to do with aesthetics and much more to do with substance and representing malt whiskey how it should be presented. These still stand toe-to-toe, -to -toe, shoulder to shoulder with their contemporaries. I fully believe that and I would recommend them to a beginner, but it's always frustrating how much better they could be, especially when it's the only representations we can get from that distillery. Jimmy Legg has bought me a dram scene. I rarely disagree with you, but I find all of these whiskies, except Glen Kinchy, because of the mouthfeel, bland or too sweet, including the Lagavulin. Jimmy, I don't doubt that that's the case for you. I would like to ask you a question. If you're out in a restaurant or a pub or something like that, and you find that the only things that they've got behind the bar are these, would you decide just to go off and drink something else? Or might you just kind of put up and, and, and enjoy these whiskies? I think that when you and I get down and settle together and then share a wee glass, I might be tempted to drop one of these in blind and see if you pick up that they're bland and sweet. I, I fully believe that you would, but it would be interesting nonetheless. I think there's often a mental toggle switch that we switch off and we decide we've passed these now. And I think you have to travel along the journey some further to realise that they have a very valid place. But you're right, the frustration is that they could be a wee bit better. I don't find any of these overly sweet, I have to say. But they're soft. They are soft. Spiritworks Tom, Tom Lindsay, you can... You can, without the slightest doubt, taste it in Loch Dew. <laughs> Just the smell of that stuff is awful, pure pish. Loch Dew, uh, it, there's actually a new one out called, uh, or new air one called Bendu, the black whiskey. But the only reason it's black, it tells you on the bottle it's all about the casks that they use to, to get it that colour. It's nonsense. It's fully spirit caramel, E150A, and it's definitely one to be avoided. They're soft and it's easy to drink and it's a nice conversation piece. But you're not going to tear through that bottle. It's not a Moorish dram. Lynn Aaron is saying, would you recommend getting older bottlings of the classic malts on auction? 
you don't need to go out and buy them all, but it's nice, just generally, not just with classic malts, I think it's nice to do that. It's nice to do it with blends. It's nice to do it with older whiskies, ones that aren't fashionable, ones that you can get for a reasonable price. All, you're never going to have a wonderfully kind of blow your socks off experience. You're going to be tasting old bottle effects. You're going to be having whiskey that's been in glass a long time. But you're getting to sip history. You're getting to sip a very specific style of whiskey. And it's a very enjoyable and educational thing to do. It's something I love to do, especially if you can pick it up cheap. And Jimmy's saying he'd have the Glen Kinchy. Dave Cummins is in. Good to, ha good to have you, Dave. I hope you're very well, my friend. Who'd have expected a year like this? Yes. Uh, good to have you back in. And he's saying uh, they really missed the chance as they don't make an open an open one Kenobi to boost sales to Star Wars nerds. And I've mean, never even considered that. Um, yeah, but don't put it past them because they did the Game of Thrones with uh, the collaboration with HBO, right? False Graph is here. I always wonder how these days people can sh uh, presume they can tell customers that a natural product can get cloudy or may uh, be of light colour. It's about education. People are happy to drink dark red wine and very, very pale Chardonnay <laughs> because they know that that's what's expected. If the expectation is not either of those things, then that's where the problem is. It's managing the expectation. It's education. Um, and unfortunately, you know, there's all sorts of things were put into play back in the days of blending and things. When the cask inconsistency or the cask wasn't there, the cask didn't give the colour that they wanted and the colour was permitted, it became a thing and then it was protecting a legacy. And sorry, it's time to move on now because the rest of the world will in Scotch might end up being the only product one day that's coloured and then the, the arse is going to fall out of it. Nobody else is going to want to touch the thing that's not natural. Blends, uh, I would still prefer it wasn't, but you can understand why a blend is coloured. A blend is a product that's got to be consistent time after time. Malt should be embracing the potential inconsistency. Malt should be a natural product. And I know that that's just me and I'm precious about malts, but I think I would get a lot of agreement there. Whiskey Straight is saying, it was Glen Kinchy that convinced me Scotch wasn't all like teachers. I explored more thereafter and here I am. They're great gateway things. That's exactly what they do very, very well. Anyway, I've been banging on for an hour. I'm going to uh, invite in my pal tonight so that we can butt heads a wee bit about the classic malts, talk about the English Whiskey Festival and get a wee game of Is It A Space Side? This is a great guy. He's putting out uh, content on uh, YouTube under Maltbox, the Maltbox channel. I'm sure you all know Andy. He's been on the channel a few times in the past now, um, but it's always a pleasure to have him back in. Andy, my friend, how are you? You, you are. Uh, is it me that's muted you? I hope not. No, you're. Hang on a second. Let's try. Speak again. How are you? You all right? Yes, you're there. there Thank you. Thank you so much, buddy. Thank you for being so patient and listening right. to me monologuing for all that time. <laughs> um, but before we got on to you, before we got on to the English stuff, um, yes. how much experience have you got with the whiskies I've been talking about? How much um, I, How much would you agree and how much would you disagree, my friend? Well, no, I, th I think you, you pretty much hit the nail on the head, to be fair. I think for a lot of people, the classic malts are arguably... Aside from maybe blends, they're, they're likely to be a lot of their first introductions to whiskey. Um, they're very yes. readily available because DRGO's got massive, massive distribution um, scale. And, you know, I think we, we mentioned before we, we came on, you know, ultimately you will likely find these in a lot of pubs. And yep. that's where a lot of people will have been drinking them back in the day as well. Um, I mean, for me, I think out of the ones you've got so far, I've not actually had too much exposure myself to them in recent years. I think they were the, the, the drums that I, I had previously, sort of like 10 years ago or nine years ago. Um, and I've not really, I've not really bought them recently. And it's not for any, any sort of, you know, untoward reason or anything. It's just, I've kind of been there, done that. You've yeah, moved on. Moved on a bit. Uh, yeah. grown a and little I bit and, yeah. I have to say, I wonder how many of these bottles I would have if I didn't have the channel, right? If I didn't have to keep up. Um, because, <laughs> you know, I, I'm trying to cater to people that are mature in their journey and people that are just coming on board with their journey. And 
uh, trying to trying to cover everything, but I think you're absolutely right, and that's the point I make about them being gateway or bridge type type whiskies. I look over your shoulder and I see a plethora of <laughs> nice uh, premium whiskies, independent bottlings, um, special editions, maybe single casks, that kind of thing. Yeah. And that's the way that we all kind of gravitate towards much more natural product. Yeah. And you know what? We're happy to pay more for it. Uh, yes, of course, there's less of it out there. But I think that, I think that, I don't, Diageo know their business very, very well. They're a super successful company. I don't want to tell them their business, but I would like to get across what I wished <laughs> their product would be. <laughs> and I think if it was just a nudge more natural, I think it would be wonderful, yeah. right? Yeah, no, I, I totally agree. I really, really do. And what you were saying before really resonated with me around that. Just that maybe extra three, or five percent, ideally. Yeah, um, I think would really just give that. We'd pay rate. for it. We would pay for it, wouldn't we? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Might... We do in, in other releases. I mean, you know, some of the, some of the other like of volume releases are higher strength, and people pay more or hundred plus the yeah. same for the for the sixteen. Um, A fifteen-year-old Del Winnie at forty-eight percent. That's an interesting whiskey for me. Oh. Yeah, right. I, I'm suddenly up in the 60, 70 pounds for, for that kind of thing yeah. instead of the 40 pounds for the kind of the diluted one. I know that they're 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 very effective at bringing people into whiskey. Is the, is the lounge is testifying tonight that they've been very, very effective at that. Yeah. Um, so there is a place for them. But but I don't think that that's where we want to see lots and lots of variation. I think we will maybe have to there will be the kind of stalwart gateway malts but i think if you're going to represent all of these fantastic distilleries that you have in your portfolio and you're only going to give us one expression from each of them come on <laughs> make it a good one <laughs> absolutely absolutely yeah. i think buddy how are you it's, it's always great to see you in here it's, it's great to welcome you again are you doing well yeah very well thank you and you know thanks for having me and um, hello to all the barflies it's fantastic to be back really really love well you me. know that there was a few barflies that pointed out to me that you were on and we were supposed to be when we did the english <laughs> whiskey uh a v yeah. pub you were supposed to play the game of is it space aid and it's not your fault it was mine I, we completely forgot no, and you got right. off scot-free but you did say at the time don't worry uh, um, you're not hiding, you'll come back and do it. So it's I thought it would be a good time. It's probably for that. Judging how well I did on the quiz or how poorly I did on the quiz, taking this, you know, is it a space out of the equation was probably the better option. Listen, if you're talking about the quiz, it's become a bit of an in joke that uh, I tell everybody every week that it's an easy quiz. But I have tried after a brutally difficult first uh, VPUB back quiz last week. I've tried really hard to make the questions fair and easy tonight. And I know that I'm going to have people throwing um, all sorts at me in the lounge, but I have genuinely tried to make it quite easy. So I hope you're going to stay, have a wee go at the quiz again, my friend. But in the, in the meantime, I mean, what when I after I'd invited you on and we'd set this up, I noticed there was a couple of social media posts went out about the English Whiskey Festival that's coming up in October. And I noticed they were, they were talking about you being involved. Tell us a wee bit about what's happening for the English Whiskey Festival. I'm excited about that. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, so it's it's basically um, kind of following on from quite a lot of, of other whiskey events that have had to um, kind of go ahead during the, the current uh, the current situation that, that's kind of going on worldwide. I'm not going to say, you know, the current times or whatever and all those cliches, but, you know, people have had to adapt. I appreciate that. We don't, say, we don't say the C word in the, in the VPUB. Nope. That's right. Thank nope. you. Exactly. <laughs> I set that one quite well, um, and uh, and yeah, this kind of follows follows on from a few other other festivals that have sort of turned virtual. So this is basically the first dedicated all English whiskey festival, um, and it's run uh, by a group of people, including Richard Foster um, of the English Whiskey Society. Um, Who uh, Richard they, joined us a few weeks back, right? He did, yeah, yeah, he did, and uh, he was he was obviously on um, alongside myself for the for the English. Um, session with yourself as well um so so basically yeah the, the idea is it's a festival that people can enjoy virtually at home um there's a lot of english whiskey distilleries that are going to be there i think about 14 15 possibly um including those that are still laying down casks or may not be necessarily at the forefront of people's minds at the minute because they've not actually released 
their official bottlings or maybe they're, they're just sort of in the process of getting them into, into the distribution um, aspect. Um, it's going to be running over two days in October. So it's going to be Friday the 16th and Saturday the 17th of October. Um, there's going to be, I think, five sessions in total. Uh, you can buy a ticket, which will basically get you access to the, the entire thing. Um, but then in addition, you can then buy tasting packs for each of the sessions. Um, and you've got some really, really good people that get involved. Um, you know, a lot of the guys from the industry, sort of like, you know, the guys from Bimba, the English. You've got a couple of the, the lesser known guys, such as Henstone. Um, you've got people like White Peak, when obviously, you know, you and I really yep. enjoyed that sample that we had. So they're, they're making some really exciting stuff. Um, and there's going to be like panel discussions and sort of like technical discussions and some that are a bit more. Do you know how far are they able to ship the tasting packs? That's always the first question that comes in. Can <laughs> can they be shipped to Europe? Can they be shipped to the States and things? It's always yeah. a challenge, isn't it? No, absolutely, absolutely. Um, I'd like to be able to tell you dis like directly. I've I've not actually been involved in the, the organizational aspects of it. Um, sure, I, so I know you're you're just supporting, right? Yes, yeah, I, I have been, um, well, myself and Boutique Dave, um, the infamous yes. Boutique Dave, have been um, sort of signed up um, to carry out the, the quiz, which is going to be taking a nice big chunk of it. So I'm actually turning the tables on you, Roy. I'll, I'll be the one doing the quiz, which, which would be a nice change. So if you're around... I'll, 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 I'll turn up just for that, just for that, and it's, I'll turn up just for that. I will, I will hold you to that. I so tell us then, if, if you don't know where it can be shipped to or what the things are, yeah. where do people go? Is there a website? Is it Eventbrite or Facebook? Or... Yeah, so there's basically, um, there is a, a mailing list. Um, there is a link um, that I can send you separately, uh, which I probably should have done at the start, so I do apologise. Um, but uh, yeah, there's, there's basically a mailing list you can sign up to. That's There's been a few mail shops, uh, mail shops going out. Um, and there, are, there is sort of like information on there with, with links and where you can buy tickets and have a look at the website. I mean, they are on Twitter as well um, and all the usual social media uh, platforms. I'm just trying to get the handle now. Um, if you or anyone wants to drop any of the links into the lounge or the chat or the comments underneath the video later, you can, you're can. you very welcome to do that. And uh, I'll make sure that um, all links are approved. Brilliant. I mean, they have got some information on their Twitter page, uh, and their handle is ENG, so ING, or yep. how I pronounce ING. ENG, yep. ENG, ENG, whiskey, without the E, obviously. Um, SOC for society. Yep. Um, so that's their, their Twitter handle. There is a link at the top of the page, it's the pinned tweet. Um, and, and yeah, there's a lot of information on there. And it, sh it should be a great couple of days. It really should. Particularly okay. quiz, obviously. Um, I mean, I'm sure that's going to be a resounding success. English Whiskey Society on Twitter. Yeah. I have to say, we, you and I had a really nice session on the VPUB a few months back, exploring English whiskies in the scene. I was amazed. You know, you're getting 14 distilleries involved. There are more than 20 distilleries now in England. And mm -hmm. um, it's, it, it's a really growing scene that are focused on a natural, good quality product. Obviously, the volumes aren't high, but the variation is, uh, it's exciting. Um, if Cotswolds, Bimber, White Peak, so many more, if any of those distilleries are anything to go by, we're in for some good times in terms of English whiskey. Um, it's, it's, it's really cool to see that happening. And if there's somebody stepping forward, I think Richard's taken this on his on himself to actually arrange this and spearhead this, right, to get the, the distilleries together to do this. Um, yeah, so, so it's Richard and a, and a couple of other guys involved in the industry that are, that are quite well known. Uh, one Sophie of, and Josh. Yeah, so Sophie, who actually works at Cooper King herself as an assistant distiller. Um, her, her partner, Josh. Um, I think Amy Seaton um, might have a bit of involvement in there as well. Excellent. Um, so it's, you know, re really great, great group of people. Um, obviously, it's very exciting times, and I think they've, they've, they've timed it quite well as well. You know, I mean, there's a lot of momentum behind English whiskey, and I think now, perversely, is probably the right time to do it. You know, you can spread out. No, absolutely. Wine. Listen, we're not able to get to the real life festivals. We're not able to turn up in the halls and get together. It's just 
we need to be canny for a while. And it's really exactly. frustrating. It's becoming more and more frustrating as time goes on. But there's we're spoiled for choice when it comes to the virtual alternative. It's, it's We have to take pleasure that, that it's happening now in these times when we've got the technology to have the alternative. So absolutely. Definitely. Belfast Whiskey Week went down a storm. I've had loads of great uh, feedback about that. An amazing event. Upcoming, the Whiskey Exchange have announced that they are having to take things virtual as well. Um, I'm looking forward to seeing what the Whiskey Exchange come out with, what they bring to us um, as a substitute for their uh, big annual event. And of course, unfortunately for me, the Glasgow Whiskey Festival as well recently announced in the last few weeks that that's, that's another uh, victim. So, you know, we just have to find uh, the Glasgow uh, Whiskey Festival, they're, they're looking at ways that they can do a similar thing as well, of course, maybe um, out in November time. But we just have to make the most of it. Um, and I'd be excited to see uh, everything that the English distillers bring along to us in that event. Um, and if you want to share any links, Andy, yourself, Richard, anybody are welcome to come on anytime and they uh, let the people know that, that that's what you're doing. If it's an event that's bringing people together, I'm all over it. I love it. Stuff. Great stuff. I know I'm, I'm famous for saying nothing guarantees good scotch more than good English whiskey, right? <laughs> I'll, get Buddy, I'll get the t-shirt printed. Yeah. Are you ready for a wee game? Let's do it. Let's do it. We're going to have we're going to have a go each, right? I'm going to ask, and you're going to ask, right? All right. So it's purely down to a question of uh, who goes first. Just for anybody that's participating or playing this for the first time, this is is at Speyside. Andy on hand. He's got a bottle. It's out of uh, sight, hidden, and I'm going to try and guess what that whiskey is in ten questions, and he's going to do the same for me as well. The, we can only answer yes or no. And of course, it has to be a core uh, expression that everybody can get their hands on of single malt whiskey. Um, who, do you want me to ask you first, Andy? It's up to you. You're the guest. You can decide. Do you know what? Yeah, you you asked me first. You asked me first. Let's let's. Okay, let's fantastic. Do let's, do let's do it. Let's get the wee countdown uh, thing up. Good luck, everyone. And I'll go in the hot seat first, Willa. And of course, Andy, I'm going to ask: Is it a space side? No. It's not a space side. Is it a Highland? Yes. It's a Highland. Okay. Uh, is it Coastal Highland? No. Is it south of, let's say, is it south of Dulwini or north of Dulwini? South. Oh, sorry. That was, that's terrible. Is it south of Dolwini? <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> sorry. It's fine. So it's non-coastal south of Dolwini. Um, Is it owned by one of the big four, that is Edrington, Diageo, Grants, or Pernod Ricard? No. Is there an age statement on it? Yes. Is it 12 or younger? No. Is the ABV higher than 43? Yes. Yes. Okay. I was doubting myself for a minute, sorry. Oh dear. Is it a Deanston? No. Damn it. I'm struggling now, Andy. I think you've pegged me. I think you've pegged me. Oh. I've got this plus my Hurley. I'm now struggling. Could be Loch Lomond, could be Edradur. Is it Loch Lomond? Yes. Right. So I've got my Harley. Is it Loch Lomond 18? Yes. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> wow. 
Unbelievable. <laughs> unbelievable, Jeff. Absolutely I had him. I unbelievable. Him. That's the second week in a row I have snatched <laughs> it like that. That's, uh, oh. People are going to be crying foul, but honestly, do you know what? See, as soon as I said Loch Lomond 18, I started to think, I bet he's pulled out an inch more or an inch more or something. But no, Loch Lomond 18, are you enjoying it at Loch Lomond 18? I am, yes, I am. I got, a very, I got it for a very good price um, in the whiskey shop flash sale. Um, and um, I've never tried the 18 before. I've had a few bottles of the 12, and I was tempted by the 12 um, today, but, uh, but I thought I'd, I'd mix it up a bit. And yeah, it's it's a, it's a nice little drum, nice little drum. Needs soaking up, I think. Yeah, I, I think um, it, sipping it in contrast with anything brings out just how unique and different it is. There's a lot of um, quite challenging, um, sometimes kind of funky industrial mm. sour things going on in there. Um, yeah, but I think it's sure. I think it it's very very interesting. Absolutely. Um, and we love the presentation of it as well. We think we love the, the, the ABV and things. and They're getting better and better. Um, Michael Henry, the guy who's in charge there, is doing some really great things. Oh, he's um, a great, great guy as well, Michael. Really, you know, really, really nice guy. Yeah. That's and he's campaigning for things to be even better all the time. I know that. Um, yeah. Great things out of Glen Scotia. Great things out of Loch Lomond. Well done. Right, I've got something here, Andy. Are you ready for another wee shot? I'll just try and keep this out of <laughs> out of sight. The bottle is here on oh, the desk. I'm nervous now. After that, I'm nervous. Right. Well, okay. you, you yeah. might, I think you might be able to do the exact same. Good luck, Andy. There Carry on when you're ready. Roy, is it a space side? No. Oh, God. Is it an island? Yes. <laughs> Damn. <laughs> Is it south of Mull? Yes. Oh, you're going to take this. This might be a record. Oh, I don't know about that one. Uh... Right, come on. Really enjoyed this old Glen Kinchy. That's it gone. Wonderful stuff. Is it an Aaron? Yes. <laughs> no way. Unbelievable. Oh no. Oh no. This is where it all goes to pot now and I have to go through the entire range. Um Well, you could snipe or you could try and just kind of uh right. reduce it into buckets. Has it got an age statement? Yes. I guarantee you there's a few people already got it in the chat. <laughs> this chat is gone. It's just lit up by Aaron, every expression of Aaron that's ever existed. I'm just <laughs> like, I'm like, I'm just, oh my God. Right, okay. So, is it the Aaron 10? Absolutely superb, Andy. I think that may be a record. I don't recall anybody getting it quicker than that. Oh, Aaron wow. 10. Well done, buddy. Well done. Heart, I'm, I'm saying well done. I am secretly gutted. You have won yourself a sniper coin. I was just I don't know if you've seen the sniper coins yet, have you? Oh, I've not. No, I'm excited. I'm buzzing. Uh, these are little glass toppers. Um, I, I'm actually, I might not have one here. <laughs> oh, yeah, I do. I have one here. And it's got the little uh, sniper logo on it, um, crosshairs in the Glen Cairn. Oh, wicked. And, and you can only get this. You can only get this by playing and winning this game. So two people in the chat are going to win it tonight from, from the Aaron 10. Two people are going to win it for the Loch Lomond 18. I'm going to send two out tonight just because it's just you and I that's on. Um, and uh, you yourself win a wee coin as well. Well done, Andy. Good man. <laughs> I can't believe that, honestly. That is mental. I, I think, honestly, I think that might be the fastest. I can't recall. Maybe Alistair Gray or one of those guys... Um, it might might recall somebody that's got it quicker than that, but that's uh, it's well done. As soon as you said, "Is it an island?" That was a snipe, <laughs> and it was a good snipe as well. Well done. Thank you. I think I'm, Matthias Mulder is saying Aaron Ten, one of my go back to whiskies. I have to say, the new Aaron Ten is a richer, sweeter thing than the previous one, uh, but it's still a very good whiskey and great presentation as we've been asking for as well. These guys are putting it out there um, at forty six percent, and but more than that, not only are they doing that but the writing non-chill filtered and natural color right on the label not much more we can ask for great stuff well done andy well done thank you Cheers, so let's, let's let's have a 
a wee chat about the couple of the classic malts that are left because I think the ones I've got left is where the really interesting stuff is. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure I've got a solid answer. I don't suppose you would know why this whiskey is bottled at 45.8%. I used to know the answer to that, and now I don't. It's completely gone out of my head. Because th th this is not. A, you mean there are there are Taliskers that are not bottled at forty five point eight percent, but that's the default ABV yeah. for so many Taliskers, and it's been that since this was launched. The Talisker ten, quite incredible. Um, but anyway, if anybody knows in the chat, chime in, because I've heard a couple of things and I'm not sure I buy into any of them fully. The most obvious one to me is that perhaps they're not chill filtering this. 45.8 is probably the cutoff point for that. Anything lower, that, then you're not going to get away with it. You have to chill filter it to keep it stable in a bottle. You can't have it clouding up and looking like there's something wrong with it when it's in storage or whatever. Um, it might be just as simple as that, but if there's a more interesting one, um, it would be uh, Nick Keeney saying Port, uh, uh, Port Askig 8 is 45.82. Ah, yes, that's true. I have from Alexia. Um, that is absolutely true. Uh, so it's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting one. Um, but I have to say that these are a polar opposite whiskies for me, Andy. Yeah. This I've never ever got on with. Really? Okay. Now Ta Talisker Fort Fifty Seven North, you know the, the special release that came out. You can still buy that yeah. wonderful whiskey, mm. cracking stuff. The port the the portree. I, I thought it was okay. Um, there's been a few other good Taliskers out there that I enjoy. I don't really enjoy the Dark Storm, the Storm or the Sky, and I don't really enjoy the Ten. I like the Eighteen. The Talisker 8, the special releases from a couple of years ago, um, there's a bottle here, actually, still here. And I can't open that because every time I open a Talisker 8, it's gone in about a month. It's just, <laughs> I love it so, so much. But the 10, I've never seen to get on with. And I don't know why. Is it the salt and pepper thing? I'm not very sure. But so many people think I'm crazy. They love it. They just love it so. Yeah. This, however, mm -hmm. this, honestly, this whiskey is why I'm sitting here right now. The reason I'm sitting here talking to you and every all these bar flies in the lounge and all the fantastic whiskey folk is because of Lagavulin 16. I was enjoying whiskey. I was loving whiskey. But a fishing trip with my brother and a, a purchase of a 20CL <laughs> bottle of Lagavulin 16 changed everything. So it's quite amazing. And I'll always have a special place in my heart and my shelf for this. And just to prove a point, can I show you this? This has just got little lights inside it, which have run out of battery, but this is an ornament now. It's a 1988-89 bottle of Lagavulin 16, the White Horse bottle. So this is the original release from way back in the late 80s. And this is it. This is a brand new bottle. Nice. I mean, it's, it's virtually unchanged. If you look closer, there are differences. This one has gold paint you can see on the glass. It has a royal warrant on there. It, they talk about moss water and things on the label, so there are differences. But look at these. From any kind of distance, they look exactly the same. 32 years in whiskey. I think we need to learn a lesson from that. It's all too easy to try and keep up and be modern and fresh um, and replace our branding all the time. I think there's a lot to be said for a bit of gentle evolution mm. and consistency. What's your opinion of Talisker and Lagavulin? Do you know what? It's, it's funny you say that. When you where you don't get on with a ten year old, I actually really really enjoy it. I um, hoped you'd say that. Yeah, I, I mean, I mentioned in the chat before that it's, I'm, I'm a little bit guilty of of not having any Talisker for quite quite a while, quite a few years actually, uh, just because I've been going down so many different other avenues. Um, the Fifty Seven North is a peach. Oh, the Fifty Seven North is a lovely drop. It really, yeah. really, really is. I think I actually quite enjoy how arguably you could use the word challenging the 10 year old is, particularly when you first opened it. You know, it's quite hot in the sense, you know, peppery, it's messy. Yeah. You've then got this really kind of, you mentioned before that sort of salinity um, aspect yeah. as well. And, and then obviously you've got the whiff of smoke and it's probably, probably one of the 
whiskies that sort of transitioned me, I guess, into into Isla Malt. So I'd actually before I had Talisker, I I tried the Beaumont Twelve and the Ardbeg Ten, and I, I don't mind admitting it at the time they were just too much for me. But I really enjoyed the Talisker, and it was a bit of a, a transition for me. Um, I think I might need to buy one actually. Now you now you mentioned it, I need to revisit it. It's been that many years. And, read that, um, read well, that from from Matthias. The reason why is forty five point eight percent because they were looking for a good cut off point indeed. Why that number? The distillery is on the coast, well above the coast. Guess how high? 45.8 metres. Right. Now, altitude is one of the things I uh, I had I had heard, but I thought it was a tale. I thought it was just one of these legends. Really, would you produce your product for 30 plus years based on... <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it might have just been coincidental that it worked as a cut point, as, as, a, as a bottling ABV as well, yeah. and that it was just a kind of nice little story. And it is one of the stories that I'd heard, Matthias. Um, if you tell me it's true, I'll believe you. Um, I think it's got so much more to do with the fact that maybe maybe Talisker isn't chill filter. That's what I want to believe. Anyway, but thanks, Matthias. Nice one. So, yeah, you're a fan. You enjoy it. I do. Yeah, I do. And like I said, I've been a bit guilty of kind of like – not abandoning Talisker as such, they're in my peripheral. Uh, it's, it's just kind of more, um, you know, looking at other other distilleries and things. It's kind of what we touched on before about evolving and going on to other other drums. Because I think explorations in human nature. So when when you kind of you get an itch for something, don't you? You know, you discover whiskey and then you just want to try and go here, there, and everywhere, and you yes. find so many rabbit holes to go down, and yeah, you, know, you find it's indie yeah, you know, I mean, you, you get like a distillery you really like the character of, and then all of a sudden you're in indie bottlings, and then there's different indie bottlers and there's different casks, and then you're just like, oh god, where can I go next? Um, and, and honestly, <laughs> you know, it, it is to the, at the point that there is far too much. We simply don't have the the money, the space, or the liver to enjoy all no. of these things. So we do have to no. make our, our choices. Um, and I think that you know the Diageo's. I don't think they really care that we've moved on past their class, classic malts. Because, like I say, they're still selling plenty of it. Oh, Would you recommend it to your former self? Would you evangelize these whiskies to a beginner that was coming in still? Have you still got a connection? Do you still remember positive experiences with you trying them back in the day when you were first getting into whiskey? Yeah, I do. I think I would still encourage myself to go for some of the bottlings. Um, I mean, the Dalwini 15 was probably still one of my favorite ones from the range, if I'm being honest with you. Um, I really like the sort of cereal note, the honey and things like that. I really yep. sort of like yep. to me. Um, and again, the Talisker, I think the Lagavulin 16, it all goes back to that consistency. I've not had a bad bottle of Lager 16. Ever. That's interesting because I have. Or let's have say you? it's not that I've had a bad bottle, but I've had bottles that that have, they, they, it does seem to, so much of it could be us, let's be honest. Yeah. But it does seem to suffer a wee bit from a certain level of inconsistencies. Um, I've heard from a few people, Doc McAllen Fine and Rare, who, was in, who I think is in tonight, um, uh, talked to me um, about being at a recent tasting and enjoying the Lagavulin 16 so much that he stocked up. So okay. that sentence in itself tells you a few things. It tells you that he believes that there's inconsistency there as well, as so many of us do, absolutely. And also that he loves it enough to stock up on it because he thinks there's a good chance that it will change again in the future. Very true. But he's willing to, he doesn't care that it's colored, he doesn't care that it's 43%. He tasted it, he said, this whiskey, the way it's been bottled just now, this condition is good, and he's buying it. My most recent bottle of Lagavulin 16 that I've got now, bought last year, is excellent, really enjoyable. Now, does it stand up to a lot of the, a lot of the other islas that I'm sipping it? That's it's sibling the twelve year old, the Port Askig ten, um, so many really big, beefy, uh, interesting islas. Maybe not, but that's not what it's supposed to do. It's just supposed to be as good as it can be as a gateway isla expression, forty three percent, and let's not forget sixteen years old. Well, you know, it, it's only it? two years away from being able to drink itself. <laughs> <laughs> but that's, that's amazing because it, it's still available. The RRP is close to 60 or 60 plus, I know. Yeah. But you can buy it for £50 or less. Isla yeah. Single Malt, 16 years old. 
Uh, yeah, I p people will not be surprised that if I was to steal one of the six classic malts and run with it, and I could only have one, um, uh, that I guess it would be uh, the Lager Villain 16, and I owe that, that Lager Villain 16 a, a, a huge debt, definitely. <laughs> what, what would your pick be? I think you've confessed it then, the the, the Delaney. Well, as much as I like the Delaney, I think I've got to agree with you on the, on the Lager. I think out, out of all of those, again, I mean, I've already said that I've not bought a Talisker for, for a number of years. Um, I've not bought a Dalwini 15 for about eight years, nine years. Um, and yet, that's Dalwini 15 you can pick up. It's still supermarket whiskey. Yeah, exactly. And you get it on offer. Yeah, it's, it's crazy. It's, well, I say it's crazy. It's kind of logical when you think about it, given the, you know, the amount of, of stock and, and, again, the distribution that they've got. But ultimately, the one that I've bought consistently since I started drinking whiskey 11 years ago is the Lager Bullen 16. I've had multiple bottles of it and that is the one that I keep going back to because um, I've, again, I mean, personally, I've, I've not had a bad one or not necessarily a bad one, as you say, but I've not found too much differential, I guess, um, yep. or not enough to put me sort of like sit, sit down and think, oh, you know, maybe, may, maybe not this time, but yeah, I, th I think it's got a bit of Lagavulin. Like I've not had too much exposure myself to the Oban. I've, I've had a bottle of it, again, years back. Uh, Glen Kinchy, not so much for me. The so, Oban is my number two pick, definitely. Yeah. Ah. So, so I know that the one would obviously be your number two pick. I think, I think There's a Knur connoisseur is having a wee go at Yesen Aquaviti talking about exploration. He has a lot of Brook Laddie on the shelf. <laughs> So somebody's got you on the big TV and they're checking to see your tins there. I can see I, the tins down in the bottom. I, I do have the tins. I mean, what you, what you can't see on the camera angle is as well as there is another set of shelves on this size out of shot and there is a lot of other bottlings there as well. I've got a lot of stuff in storage around the other corner. The Brooklady is just next. It looks pretty. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, that's just that's just your, your A's, your B's and your C's on that section there, right? <laughs> exactly. You know, I mean, when you're doing the alphabet, you've got to start at the top, haven't you? Um, but I mean, when, when you talk about Brook Laddie, there's still, you know, you've got Port Charlotte there, you've got yeah. your, your Isle of Valley releases, there, there, is, there is variation to an extent, but yeah, I, I, I get it, hands up, yeah. You do like a bit of Brook Laddie, excellent, yeah, nothing wrong with that. <laughs> uh, Keener Dot, uh, Shimini Charlie, Keener Dot, she's in and she's saying, what do you think about the Lagavulin 12 uh, limited edition? I love it, there was a time I went off it for a wee while, or let's say, I think the only time I ever bought it was it was about 70 pounds 65 pounds and it just kept jumping up in price and the next time i bought it was 90 pounds because it was amazing um and i remember do you remember ah uh, is it phil it's phil isn't it from whiskey wednesday that is phil yes it? yeah he yes. used to be joe and it's, it's phil now isn't it yeah he get he gave that uh he reviewed that that year that came out 2017 he gave it a 10 out of 10 um, and it was around about the same time that I got to try it. And uh, but I mean, when he gave it ten out of ten, I'd already decided I was going to have a take a punt on it anyway. Um, <laughs> and and the twenty seventeen Lagavulin like twelve, Charlie, that was the that was the the, the Lagavulin that got me back in to paying money for Lagavulin again, where I'd where I'd kind of fallen out with it a bit. Like I say, I kind of felt like the, the things had dipped a wee bit. But so much of it is us. So much of it is is our own interpretation, our own uh, subjective op opinion from time to time. But yes, I stayed away from Lagavulin in 2017. I got right back into it again. And now I've actually got a section like Andy's Brook Laddie section there. There's a wee section in my cabinet that's <laughs> just Lagavulin. <laughs> um, wonderful. Just, just, just out of interest then, I'm, I'm going to ask you a question now, if that's all right. Yeah, go ahead. We've obviously mentioned, you know, the, the lag volume 16 is generally 60, you can get it at 50, and you've already touched on the set, the, the 12 going up and up and up. How, yes. how did you feel at the time spending 90 quid on a 12-year-old lag volume? Uh, without, without taking people's oh, thoughts, there's no. I mean, out. that wouldn't have been long after. It was only about four or five years ago that all the expensive whiskey that I was enjoying was bought. The whiskey rev was buying that. My, my friend, because he, he, you know, he would study and he would just buy maybe one or two bottles a month mm. but there would be good bottles whereas i was buying i was that was just the the rabbit holes for me i was going everywhere yeah, i was just trying to get my hands on as much as i could yeah. um 
and we were kind of watching YouTube and reading reviews and buying books and studying and buying and trying to explore all the whiskey we possibly could. It was really like an arms race from about 2012 to 2016. It was just, it was full on getting our hands on everything. But I still struggled to spend more than 50 pounds on a bottle of whiskey. I really, I really had to kind of justify it to myself. And I still have that issue a wee bit today. Um, Unfortunately, I've tender, tenderized myself to the point that it's too easy to drop a hundred pounds on a bottle of whiskey, which is I'm trying to I'm trying to reflect a little bit there because it does get out of hand too quickly, doesn't it? <laughs> Definitely, it's whenever the doorbell rings at the minute. I'm like, oh god, what did it over again? What was it? More whiskey coming. Yes, oh, of course it's yes. Totally like. Uh huh. Oh, I'm I'm passing the whiskey shop. I'll just nip in and see if they've got anything. You know, just have a wee look, just have a chat. So okay. just nipping. I, I know all of my local delivery drivers by the first names now. Really nice guys. You know, lo lovely guys. But uh -huh. you know. listen, my, my UPS guy today said, Roy, I see you've ordered more whiskey. If you're not <laughs> in the future, are you okay if I tuck it behind your door? Because <laughs> obviously the whiskey needs a, a signature. And I said, I absolutely don't worry. Just uh, I showed them a wee secret spot that you can stash it. That happened this very day. Oh, um, yeah, and I, I was actually that bottle. I was expecting it to be a bottle of Glen Kinchy Twelve, and I don't know how I got my my basket confused and I ordered the wrong thing. So I couldn't do a comparison tonight. But maybe I'll save it for doing an antique versus contemporary in the future. You are staying for the quiz tonight, aren't you, buddy? I am indeed. Good man, good man. Let's uh, before we start the quiz up. Let's jump in and say Richard Agnew's having a laugh at me saying an arms race. Haha, <laughs> yeah, that's how I often refer to the whiskey revenized tasting time together. Exactly that, an arms race. Luna Aaron is saying chats in the whiskey shop is so dangerous. Yes, especially if you're taking the train and they're pouring you wee tablespoon samples to let you try things. It's a very effective technique, and uh, I always come home. But I always come home with something delicious, honestly, especially if it's a place like your Good Spirits Company in Glasgow. Um, Jimmy Legge is saying $135 for the Lagville in 16 here, that's Canadian dollars that, that may be part of my problem Aquaviti, yeah it sounds a bit pricey Jimmy, mm -hmm. I know that the dynamics in Canada is, are, are, are tricky from time to time, I know you've got a lot of challenges there, um, but $135 um, even Canadian does sound a wee bit on the pricey side honestly you're absolutely right, Jay Francis my friend good to see you um, Steve answers uh, answer sounds right on the 45.8% ABV. It's 80 imperial proof. Ah, uh, 80 imperial proof. Because 40 would be uh so British Imperial rather than New World um oh. proof. Um I wonder if that's true. I hadn't heard that one before. That's interesting. Yeah, the same uh Matthias Mulder, it's not the height. Just search a picture of the distillery. It's on the coast. Um, I would go with 45.8 feet as possible, but 45.8 metres uh, high. That's quite high. Absolutely. Um, absolutely. Uh, and <laughs> Sachin is, uh, or, uh, Sachin, actually, it was Sachin he was on last week playing as at Space Aid. He's ordering a Talisker 57 North now. Thanks for the recommendation. That's when I get nervous because it's not a cheap bottle. It's about 70 or 80 quid. Um, I hope it does you quite well, Sachin. Feedback to us and let us know how you're getting on with it. I, I think it's a cracking whiskey. In fact, it's probably after that eight year old, that would be the one that I would go for. The eight year old is almost impossible to get your hands on now. Gregor McQueen's in Aquavita. It's when a delivery person refuses to deliver to you as an act of intervention. You need to worry, Roy. Absolutely. It's not happened yet. It's keeping him <laughs> in, a, in a job. P. Head is saying, I suggest we skip the E word regarding the quiz. Frank. Deal. I won't suggest it, but I think it is. <laughs> I think it should be uh, okay tonight. Let's uh, let's get this wee quiz up. Graham Fraser is saying, <laughs> "Angle of the Talisker line arms. See, we're all over the place. You'd think that I would just reach out to to Diageo and say, what's the deal with the forty five point eight percent ABV? There's lots of theories out there.'" Somebody knows it for sure, but and amongst all the, the noise, they might not get heard. Okay, buddy, let's start this wee quiz. 
Uh, uh, listen, thanks everybody for joining tonight. So many of you kind of pull a wee parachute and disappear for the quiz at the end. I would encourage you to stay and have a bit of fun with it. You, you're only playing against yourself. Um, I think you might have a chance uh, tonight that's multiple choice anyway. So you've got a 33% chance. And a lot of the questions you'll find I might have mentioned or dropped a wee hint throughout the show on the lead up to these. So you might be able to whittle it down to a 50 50 or something. But you only need to share your score if you want to. It's just for a bit of fun, just to pique a little bit of curiosity. Andy's in the hot seat tonight. He's the one under a wee bit of pressure. Um, but I know you can handle it. Scogsmard is here. Good to see you. Jimmy Jazz is here as well. I never even spotted you in earlier, Jimmy. But Scogsmard is saying, seems I missed most of today's stream. I'll catch the replay. I appreciate it, Scogsmard. I thank you so much for catching it up if you can. It's a good thing about these. I know it's two hours, but you can chop it up into wee chunks or just pick up the things that you're interested in. My housekeeper needs to improve, though. I could timestamp these, but that means I have to sit through my own video. <laughs> That's very <laughs> difficult to do, <laughs> to listen to yourself. Um, and Kevin Grant is admitting he's feeling a solid 3 out of 10 coming on tonight for him. Kevin, not at all. I think you'll do quite well, big guy. Let's see how we do. Question one, Andy, good luck. Good luck, everybody. Which of the six original classic malt distilleries briefly switched away from worm tubs in the 1990s? Now, this is as a form of condensation. They switched to shell and tube, realised that they'd made a big mistake and quickly spent a fortune putting the worm tubs back in place. Which distillery am I referring to? Was it A, Legavulin on Isla, B, Dalwini in the Highlands, or C, Glen Kinchy in the Lowlands? Uh, there is a way for the knowledgeable amongst you to whittle that down to a 50-50 if you don't know. Legavulin 16 is such a familiar homecoming dram to me. It's wonderful. 1990s. Um, my gut's saying um, Glen Kinchy, but I think I'm actually going to go with. Because I don't trust my gut at all. Um, I'm going to go with <laughs> Dalwini. <laughs> I can tell you that uh, the chat is moving quite fast and they seem to fancy B for Dalwini, but there's been a uh, Banana skin emoji pop out a lot. Might it be before this quiz started? They could, okay. those come along. The quiz, uh, sorry, the, the, the lounge definitely think it's B, and you're absolutely right, Andy. <sighs> Dull one A. Uh, now, Glen Kinchy also have, uh, they have cast iron worm tubs. So they do have worm tub condensation as well. But in the 90s, Dull one A got rid of them and put in shell and tube um, and decided that the whiskey did not taste the same mm. and quickly uh, did a 180. So there you go. If you answered B, give yourself a point. Question two, an American question. Larceny bourbon is named in connection with what? Larceny bourbon, what's the name about? Is it A, was it an illicit distiller? Was it B, a thieving treasury agent? Or was it C, a stolen mash bill recipe? Larceny has been given the name larceny, obviously something to do with theft or something shadowy or underhand but is it an illicit distiller a a thieving treasury agent b or a stolen mash bill c mm -hmm. so we're all we're obviously going to be looking at the americans that are in tonight the north americans to see if we can uh... <laughs> i think either either way he was a very naughty boy wasn't he whatever he's done he was um, up to no good for sure he was definitely. he was either wouldn't trust him uh -huh. wouldn't trust him um I mean, illicit distilling is quite quite common in the states, isn't it? Really, you get a lot of moonshiners in, in like Virginia and places like that. So I can't imagine that that's going to be a particularly massive surprise to anybody to, to name a release after it potentially. Um, so I think it's either B or C. I'm going to go C. I think a stolen or copied Marshall recipe. Yeah, let's go with that. It's split in the chat as well. Not many people are going for A for the illicit distillation. Um, some people think it's the same as you, Andy. Some people think it's B. I have to let you down, buddy. It's uh, actually um, a man from the Treasury who had the keys to the warehouse was also a passionate whiskey fan, and he knew where the best casks were. And that's the, the casks that he was caught pilfering from. And wow. that's how the name Larceny came about, because um, Larceny, as I suppose the theory has taken from their best casks, um, the man was John E. Fitzgerald, and he ended up getting caught in the end. But he got a, he got a, a story out of it, didn't he? 
Exactly, yeah, definitely. Question three. Which of the extended classic malts was previously a 15-year-old flora and fauna release? So this is extended. It's not the original six, but it was previously a flora and fauna, but at 15 years old. Was it Ben Rinnis, Glen Elgin, or Kalila? A, Ben Rinnis, B, Glen Elgin, or C, Kalila? Hmm. Stevie, I like using the bar flies to separate the questions. I noticed that Whiskey Jason's not in tonight. <laughs> Might be a busy man. Um, well, okay. Okay. Ah, right. <laughs> ah, you got me doubting myself, Roy. Honestly. It's difficult, isn't it? It is. It's, it's one of those things you look at it and you, you kind of second, you know, second think about it. Yes. Doubt yourself. Um, I, I'm, I'm going to go with, um, I'm going to go with B, Glen Elgin. Glen Elgin B mm. was a, was a 15-year-old when it was a flora and fauna. It's since been upgraded, given its own identity and brand, and released as part of the extended classic malts. I can tell you that um, Steve A is saying, I started using Ashat for the separator. <laughs> yes, no. Um, this one's actually all over the place, although most people think it's C for Kalila, Stewie Baby, Blair Stevenson, uh, uh, Mark McKenzie. That's a new name, Mark. Good to have you in. Uh, Rotters Laugh Traps, good to have you back again, my friend. Is C, Kilted Moose C, Multi Agus Muncher C, Martin Breda, also C, I can tell you yes. Kalila was previously a flora and fauna at 15 years old. Wow, did not know that. Wow. Yeah, I've got a bottle of it through there, but it's still sealed. The amount of people that tell me it's terrific whiskey. <laughs> it's so tempting to, but I'll find a way. Maybe I'll take it over to Isla and actually sit in Kalila and open it. That would be a good idea. Like, if you had to say, there you are, you said it yourself. It's difficult. It's difficult when you have to guess, Frank. David Owen is saying, I think my wife is going to slap a whiskey buying ban on me. Uh, listen, it's real. It's real. We have to remember that uh, it can get out of hand, absolutely. Claude Hooker is in. It was nice to see you on Sunday night, Claude. Good to have you in here again. Uh, two out of three, along with Desi, Mikey, and Des. Jimmy Jazz is on full marks, as is Jay Francis on three out of three. Question four, Signature Vintage was founded by Andrew and Brian Symington in which year? So uh, one of the one of the bigger, more recognisable independent bottlers. Which year did they come along? A, 1978. B, 1988. Or C, 1998. Did they come along 10 years before the classic malt? The same year as the classic malts, or ten years after the classic malts. Signature oh, vintage. I'm I'm actually. Oh God! Right. Okay. I think I'm I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go A this time because I think I know that I've seen older Springbank bottlings in the dumpy bottles that are signature. I'm sure that's signature. I was born in '88. This isn't fair. Um, I'm, I'm um, <laughs> now you're showing off. <laughs> it's like, um, if it makes you feel any better, I feel, I feel a lot older after going for a run today. Um, <laughs> I'm not doing that again. Not making that mistake. Um, I'm gonna, yeah, I'm gonna go with A. Let's go with A. Let's do it. 1978. Yeah, let's do it. And Greg's whiskey guide is saying, "Yep, not the oldest indie bottler for sure." John Della Cuisine thinks it's B, 1988. Jimmy Legg thinks 1998 is too late, surely. Dogs Have No Uncles is in, good to see you, saying C. Frank Rochford is saying flying guest B, it said Martin B. Let's see who's going to join Dogs Have No Uncles for C, Brian Sky. That looks like a new name, Brian. Um, good to have you, but you're absolutely spot on. It's 1998. 22 years old. 22 years old, not been doing it for as long as you might imagine. So many of the independent bottlers are, are uh, much newer than you than you think. No way, I would not have guessed that. No. Yes, 1998. Cool. Sorry, buddy, here comes the picture question. Eyes on the screen, an entrance, a gateway into a courtyard, quite a familiar scene, but you can see quite an ugly big block. I've blocked out the name of the distillery. Um, obviously, I'm going to just straight ask up which distillery is this? <laughs> One of the classic malts. Are we looking at Dalhoney, Craig and Moore, or Glen Kinshie? A, Dalhoney in the Highlands. B, Craig and Moore in Speyside, or C, 
Glen Kinchy in the Lowlands. What are we looking at there? Now, I've not visited any of those distilleries. Full confession, I have not, dis- I have not visited any of them. So this is purely going to be a guess, a bit like the other ones. Um, are the gates green? Are the gates green? Got some... People are, Peter, Greg is shouting at me saying question three is wrong. Well, I, I don't want to go back to question three. What is this? No, it's, it's absolutely right, Greg. Question three is spot on. I'll go and get the bottle if you like. <laughs> um, right, so it was Glenkinchy, Darwinny, or oh, Cragmore. Yes. Um, I'm, I'm just gonna I'm gonna take a punt. I am gonna go for. I don't think I don't think it's Delwini, so I'm gonna I'm gonna ignore that once. It's between Cragmore and Glenkinchy. Let, let's let's go uh, let's go Cragmore. Let's, let's do it. Let's okay. Do it. We'll get to that in a second because we're having a mutiny. There's a revolt happening in the lounge. Oh, is it? Oh, yeah, people are telling me that it's minutes, wrong. So. I've picked up some wrong stats for. Um, for signatory vintage, let's see if I can grab. I've got a book on hand. This, this is not the book where I got the the fact, but I'll see if signatory vintage vintage is in here and what they're saying about when they were. Oh wow! Founded in nineteen eighty eight. So you're right. You can have your point. Or no, you said 78, didn't you? I, Sorry. Sorry, Andy. Well, it was actually founded in your birth year of 1988. Now, that's super exactly interesting. No, I did, I did. I, I, and uh, you need to go and get the other book I was using earlier <laughs> <laughs> to see if it's a typo that's been corrected. I mean, surely this invalidates the entire quiz, Roy. I mean, yeah, that's right. Uh, listen, if Andrew Symington's watching, he, he'll be, <laughs> there'll be an email dropping in saying, Hear you, you diddy. Um, <laughs> Was this the book I got the fact from earlier? Okay, it doesn't really matter. Um, Charlie and so many others. No, that says 1988 in this book as well. But I was reading about the classic malts and, and, and such things, so it could have been one of the other books. Yes, I apologise and thank you, Barflies. Well um, anybody that answered B for 1988 for question four are absolutely spot on. It was. Um, and Jimmy Legg was right, suggesting that 1998 was a bit... Uh, too recently um, and I can tell you that anybody that's suggested like Andy has that this is Craig and Moore B, absolutely right uh, Dalwini is quite an obvious big exposed place Greystone, Glen Kinchy again is Greystone but kind of much more lowland kind of fieldy setting, these cream buildings um, and this courtyard with Craig and Moore you'll maybe see just behind here um, uh, this is clearly Craig and Moore and Speyside, well done if you said B we want a question six. Gordon and McPhail have owned Benromic Distillery since 1993, but purchasing it from who? They've, bought, they've had uh, Benromic for a long time. Who did they buy it from? Uh, United DCL, UDV, whoever you want to call them. We now know them as Diageo. Did they buy it from Diageo? A. Allied Distillers, B. Or Angus Dundee, C. This is quite embarrassing because I actually manned the stand for Ben Romick about five years ago, and I must have told, I must have said, like, I've gone through the entire history and who they bought it off, like 150 times. <laughs> now, now that I've seen yeah. it on the screen, it's completely gone. Um, uh, that's the thing, isn't it? I mean, you wait. Well, I, such a- one of one of those three didn't exist. So you, you would whittle this down to a 50-50 back in uh, mm. 93. Okay, let's, um, let's get my thinking cap on. Um, I, I reckon A. I reckon A. Um, I seem to, because the thing that I'm tired about, I don't recall using the word Diageo. I seem to either remember using the word United or Allied for some reason. So I reckon it's A, hopefully. I have to say that the majority of the lounge agrees with you with some people plumping for Allied, a couple for Angus Dundee. But you're absolutely right, Andy. United, UDV, uh, DCL, or, or as we now know them, Diageo. 
that's who originally owned Binromac way back when. There's never been a flora and fauna or anything from Binromac, but there, there has been some rare malt spotlings come out, cast strength, limited release stuff, Binromac, which is bizarre to see as you're releasing that, but that's the reason. So if you yeah, answer A, give yourself a point. Question seven. The Knock and Spiric, and I hope I'm pronouncing that well, I think I'm pronouncing it well, the Knock Knocknan Spiric Burn is a water source for which of uh, the six original classic malts? Notice the wording, six original classic malts. Is it A, Talisca, B, Kalila, or C, Lagavulin? Knocknan Spiric. Okay. Um, <laughs> Well, if it's if it's the original, then I'm gonna gonna ignore it. No B. Um, oh, I'm gonna get some some shreds if I get this wrong. Uh, let's let's go for let's go for let's go for lager. Let's go for lager one. Let's go for C. Well, there's something in the question that makes it a 50-50 rather than a 33% chance because we've just covered the fact that anybody that says B for Kalila, um, unfortunately, that's uh, not one of the original six classic malts. It's not one of the whiskies sitting over my shoulder. It's one of the extended classic malts as we covered. So it's either Talisker or Lagavulin. And unfortunately for Andy, it's actually Talisker. Lagavulin is uh, Loch's... Ah, I'm going from memory now. The Solon, oh, no. Solon, yeah. Solon locks, Solon locks or something. Um, but yeah, Knocknan Spiric, which I didn't know until today. I found this question. Um, it's Talisker. Cool. Uh, Good knowledge. See, it was how's the chat going on? Jimmy Leg is happy on four out of seven. Okay, Jimmy, how'd you get on with this one? Craig Elliott and which two classic malt distilleries are forever linked with White Horse? A, Lagavulin and Glen Elgin, B, Glen Elgin and Talisker, or C, Talisker and Lagavulin. <laughs> we have to know our kind of history about Restless Peter Mackey mm. and the famous White Horse blend, but he owned Craig Allachie. Um And these two other distilleries that are inextricably linked with White Horse. Yeah, and um, there's, there's two options there that are kind of screaming at me. Um, <laughs> and again it's kind of picking between them and it's because of one of the distilleries that's in the two options it's, which is exactly. why it's structured exactly like that <laughs> yeah. so there's, there's one constant Ellen um, McLaughlin just dropped in saying evening all made it in the end had a virtual uh, leaving night for a colleague that went later than I thought still we'll catch everything I missed on the replay thanks for that Alan thanks for joining us quite late um, even leaving nights have to be virtual these days it's crazy crazy times I hope you had a good night and it's nice to welcome you in at the end it's, uh, it's given a, it's given an, uh, Andy a wee bit of time to think. It is. Thanks for that. Um, I'm going to go with A because Lagavulin is the one that's kind of screaming to me because I, I seem to recall some sort of connection between Lagavulin and, and Whitehall. Restless Peter Mackey and Lagavulin, absolutely. It's um, just a question of whether you're picking Talisker or Glen Elgin to go along. Think, You've picked yeah. Glen Elgin and you're absolutely right to do that. Lagavulin and Glen Elgin uh, is uh, firmly associated. Uh, with White Horse. McAllen Final Rare Dock is, is correct to me. Or did, I, did I say Solemn Lochs? Is that what I said? I can't remember. But that's the water source for Lagavulin. and Kim Grant on Whiskey is saying, save yourself. Well, you can. It's another tough quiz. Damn it. Is it impossible for me, for me to make an easy quiz? I mean, I'll be honest, Roy, but the corruption element doesn't help either. It's, it's even more challenging than usual. It's just Listen, I apologise to everybody for question four. <laughs> But listen, I don't, it doesn't matter if you get question four right or wrong. It's, I've, made, I've made a mess, and uh, if we follow the rules of the VPUB quiz at the end, you get yourself a point when I when I mess it up. Second from last, the original Glen Kinchy 10-year-old was upgraded to 12 years old. But what happened to the ABV? A, it increased from 40 to 43. B, it stayed the same at 43. Or C, it dropped from 43 to 40. I think I actually pointed to this when I held the 10-year-old Glen Kinchy <laughs> earlier and mentioned it. Uh, but there you go. 
Glenn Kinchy, 10-year-old, in the classic malts. It was given a promotion to a 12-year-old. But what happened to the ABV? Did they up it? Did they keep it the same? Or did they drop it? Um, You did mention it, but... I mean, how many... Oh. Right, 43. Uh, I, I, I'm, yeah, I'm going to go C. I think they dropped it to 40%. Or did they? Hmm. Dogs yeah, have no uncles. Six. Thinks it's B. Greg's wiki guide said, "I had it, but not sure now." Hoyt thinks they dropped it. They're agreeing with you as the stew baby, and Desi Mark thinks it's B. Kev Grant on whiskey thinks the increase from forty to forty-three, and Alan McLaughlin is saying not C. Okay, I can tell you all that. Yes, it's just stayed the same. Oh. The ten-year-old was forty-three percent, and it stayed at forty-three percent. Um, the only 40% in the Classic Malts lineup, I think, is the Craig and Moore. It's the softest of the three in terms of ABV. Right. Jimmy Leg, I hope you're still with us. I'm not sending you off tonight without an ASAC question. There will be an ASAC question, and tonight I've saved it till last. Um, I think this qualifies for such a thing. Question 10. There are 11 flora and fauna expressions currently released. How many has there been since they launched? Now, some of you might have watched my Flora and Fauna video, which I tell everybody exactly how many has been released since they launched. But that's not the option I'm looking for. Is it A, more than a number of current Diageo malt distilleries? Is it B, coincidentally, the same number as current Diageo malt distilleries? Or C, is it less than the number of current Diageo malt distilleries. So yes, this is the ASHA. You have to know how many malt distilleries Diageo have in operation. I did mention it earlier in the stream. I didn't mention how many flora and fauna expressions there are, but I'm only asking you, is it more or less than the number of distilleries? You're about the, <laughs> if you can see the chat, <laughs> it is absolutely lit up with ASHA emojis. Um, oh. <laughs> You're a bad, bad yes. man, Roy. Oh, Steve, baby's upset. He's he's in four out of nine. He's got his fingers crossed. And he's saying no ass hat. And unfortunately, I think it's a bit of an ass hat. You've got a one in three chance, do you? Come on. Um. Right. So, <laughs> Hell's so to say, what? You're living currently. <laughs> mm -hmm. Sid Martin is calling me a git. You're spot on. J James also up as well. Ass hat, Steve, eight ass hats. Good to have you in, James. Good to have you back. Uh, Des is saying, us, I give up. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. I, I lose to... friends. I lose friends. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, Rob, with questions like this, I'm not surprised. I'll be honest. I'll put it out there. Um, yes. Yes. How many How many operational distilleries do you think the Azure has? It's a lot. It's 20. I can't remember if you said earlier. It was 25 or 28, I think. They have 28 operational distilleries. 28. Sorry, I'm just going to have to uh, move some. some McCann Finer Rear, the doc, has said 26 versus 28, and I spot on. So the answer is clearly less. There's been less flora and fauna expressions released in their entire time of life, 26 um, out of... Uh, and there's been 28 Diageo distilleries. The, the numbers are not related in any way. I'm just comparing the two. Um, just a bit of an asset question in the end, but just to, just imagine that the Azure have malt distilleries, 28 in Scotland, and uh, Flora and Fauna, there have been 26 released over the years. Good luck in tracking down lots of them. Now going to be very, very difficult. Let's see how the lounge is doing for the scoring. Stevie A is taking his pass on 7 out of 10. Well done. Ted B on an 8 out of 10. Excellent score along with Tony Evans on an 8 out of 10. Superb. Uh, C Collectivum 28. Absolutely, Doc. That gives it away. Roman numerals, of course. And that's potentially um, the only malt that we can grab. It's a blended malt, of course, that we know there's some resile in there of some description. Uh, unless... Unless I'm mistaken, there's, there could potentially be others out there. Alexandru's on 8 out of 10 along with Ashkay Jetley. That looks like a new name. Or sorry, Akshay Jetley. It's a new name. Welcome in, Akshay. Nice to have you. Uh, anybody else going to be able to beat that? Falsegraph is saying just wanted to change back. So 8 out of 10 today. Not bad. Great score as well, Falsegraph. 
The one Glassman Warner is on nine out of ten, not bad at all. I think that's an epic score. I don't see any ten out of ten emojis. Oh, Charlie, my turn to win the quiz. She is scoring a ten out of ten. Charlie, just for you, as a member of the Aquavita Barflies, there is a ten out of ten emoji. You're welcome to use it. Uh, well done. Fantastic. Well done. 8 out of 10 for Mikey Hay. Superb. Dogs of No Uncle. 7. Dez. 6 out of 10 on a pass. Brilliant. Martin Breda. 9 out of 10. Great score, Martin. Um, Mark McKenzie. Fail. 4. Maybe next time, Mark. Still a, still a decent score. 5 out of 10 is a pass mark in here. Arnie Tiger made it on a 5 out of 10. Along with Yash Desai. Looks like a new name. Managed to scrape through with a lucky guess at the end. That's all it takes. Yash, welcome in. Lassie Hort Otsman, good to have you in. <laughs> and you're not, you're not admitting, you're just saying slash 10. <laughs> Graham Fraser is saying 7 out of 10. Pulled it back at the death. Uh, Knorr Connoisseur is 9 out of 10. Superb. And uh, Che Francis, 9 out of 10 as well. I'm scrolling down to see if there are any more 10 out of 10s to match Charlie. Spiritworks Tom did it. And it looks like uh, Jimmy Legg is claiming that he might have got a 10 out of 10, but I'm sure he didn't because he was angry at me a wee bit earlier on. But it works, Tom. If you scored 10 as well, well done, Tom Lindsay. Fantastic stuff. Listen, everybody, please bear in mind that there is lots and lots of virtual whiskey festivals on the horizon. Save the dates as they come along. I'll share the ones that I'm interested in, the ones that I'm hopefully going to be uh, participating in as um, part of the function itself or potentially part of the audience, the ones I'm excited about. I, I'm certainly excited about the English uh, Whiskey Festival in October. I'm excited about the Whiskey Exchange one that's coming up as well. I'm excited about what could potentially be done at the Glasgow one. Very excited about the, the Whiskey Tribe, the Bastards Ball. There's going to be a form of some kind of quiz. I don't think I'm going to get away with doing this style of quiz, uh, but we're going to be doing something like that for their uh, online uh, event as well. So there's lots happening to kind of ease us into the darker nights as summer ends. And we go into kind of more whiskey drinking season. Uh, I hope you'll join me along the way as well. Andy, I really love having you in, buddy. Thanks for joining tonight. Thanks for stepping up and taking the challenge twice, actually, as asking and answering. Um, thanks for hanging out with me for a wee while. I wish you the very best for the festival that's upcoming. And also wish you the best for the channel as well. If anybody doesn't know Andy, of course you must already, but the channel on YouTube is Maltbox. You're still putting out a weekly, weekly review. What day does it drop? Um, it's At the minute, it's uh, either one or two a week, Thursdays and Sundays, or Excellent. one a week, then one, one of those two. So, yeah. Excellent you. stuff. Excellent. Thank you so much, Andy, and thanks to all you fabulous uh, whiskey folk as well. Andy, stay till the end. We'll raise a wee glass and have a wee bit of a debrief, and uh, uh, I hope that if there's any links or anything to share, share it in the in the comments below or I'll even give it to me and I'll put it in the description box as well so it's permanent and uh, I wish you all the very best. Thank you for joining me, my friend. Hang around. No. Cheers. Cheers. Jimmy Legs just bought me a dram saying good for it, fun Roy and Andy. Thanks to everybody. J Jimmy, it's always a pleasure to have you. Um, and by all means, have a go at me, especially when I uh, mess things up on the quiz and get the answer wrong. Apologies to Andrew Symington and Signature Vintage as well, but indeed it seems that you were formed in 1988. I'm going to find where that typo is. <laughs> because when I read it, I thought, wow, they're that young. That's going in the quiz. So there you go. Always double check. Always double check. I should learn. Graham Fraser saying, thanks again, Roy. Nice to get back in on a regular routine again, Graham. You're very welcome. It's nice, really nice to have you. Precarious Dave is in as well. Uh, oh, where did the chat go? Catch up where Stevenson is saying, thank you. Jean de la Cuisine is saying, cheers, everyone. Going back to Oban to wrap things up. Fantastic. Thanks again, Aquavite. Another great night. Thank you, Kevin. Thanks so much. Good night, all, and Slancha. This is always wonderful. It's a pleasure. Next week's VPUB is going to be interesting. It's going to be a blind tasting. I've got a panel coming in. They've got to select the blind drams based on nothing more than the tasting notes that come with the whiskies. They've got to select the blind drams from the tasting notes. So the theme of next week's VPUBs is going to be about tasting notes and just trying to kind of debunk that whole idea that they're pretentious and they're nonsense and they're invented and made up. Yes, they're a bit whimsical and fanciful at times, but people try really, really hard to articulate what the whiskey experience is for them. Um, so we're trying to work out the place for tasting notes and just how accurate they are. So we're doing a wee blind tasting. Some folk from Glasgow Whiskey Club uh, and some uh, industry, uh, well, one of them's from the industry, let's say, but she's a friend of mine as well, Julie Hamilton, and a, a, another couple of guys, Stefan and Peter from the Glasgow Whiskey Club as, as a panel. 
who's going to come on and take these this blind challenge on and see if they can match the drums from tasting notes alone. I'm looking forward to that. I think it'll be an exciting thing to do. And I hope that you'll join me for that as well. In the meantime, I want to say thank you so much for hanging out with me for another Thursday night. It's always wonderful fun. It's always brilliant. I really look forward to my Thursday nights and I'm actually quite enjoying the fact that it's a weekly thing now. I hope you are too. Thanks to everybody for all your support. Thanks to the beautiful whiskey folk. Thanks to the dedicated barflies. And I'll see you all um, a week from tonight. What an absolute blast and a pleasure to have you again. Thanks to Andy. Thanks to uh, all my moderators and the uh, uh, admin too. Good night and slanjava, everybody. Mm -hmm.